Hundreds of years ago, strange monsters called demons began to appear all over the world. These were huge, scary creatures with powerful claws, and because of the danger of this, the number of countries was reduced to seven. People were able to survive by building a barrier against the demons and placed all their hopes on those whose strength could resist the monsters, namely the magicians. These mages were ranked by their strength, and the strongest mages were named the only ones. And he too. The main character, sitting at the top, watched the demons running from below and, jumping from a tree branch, began to attack it, counting that there were ten or twelve or even more of them. He stopped in front of the monsters running towards him and, calmly looking at it, used the chain formula 207 chain resonator. This magician was the best among thousands of others, a first rank magician. This powerful magician was called Aluz Rijan. Aluz's sword, tied to the chain that appeared, spun, cutting the demons, and when it was finished, Aluz turned his back to the corpses of the demons and said that everything was done. He took out a flask of water and, opening it, poured the water over his head. Aluz thought that he had to go through many battles to get here, but it was much better than going with the army. Aluz walked through the forest and, grinning, noted that it was a pity that such a beautiful place was located in a world filled with demons behind the barrier. Looking at the birds flying in the sky, Aluz admitted that he wondered what it would be like to be free. He sadly watched the animals soaring above and thought that one day he would do this. A couple of weeks later at the Alpha Army headquarters, Aluz stood in front of a grown man sitting in a chair at a desk. The man asked if Aluz had changed his mind. Aluz replied that he had not changed his mind because this was the condition of his resignation. He explained that the world beyond the barrier had been completely restored, so he had fulfilled his duty and wanted to be free. The man frowned at Aluz and, rubbing his chin with his hand, admitted that Aluz was very important to humanity, and therefore he could not just let him go and allow him to retire. Aluz interrupted the words of the Governor General, reminding that according to the regulations, someone who served for more than ten years and accomplished many feats can calmly resign. He said he joined the army at the age of six, so this year his service will reach ten years. Aluz looked seriously at the Governor General and admitted that he had already worked enough. The Governor General, looking at Aluz, pursed his lips tightly and thought that Aesil is protected by seven countries, but the number of deaths of magicians is constantly growing, while the great country of Alpha is the only one that was able to accomplish the greatest number of feats and reduce the number of victims. He noted that all this was thanks to one person, namely the magician Aluz. The Governor General lowered his head and thought, if they lose a lose, they will forget about expanding the territory and living a good life, and then hard times will come. He suddenly came up with something and, noting that he was ashamed to say this as a general, asked a lose out loud what he thought about a long vacation. The Governor General promised that they would consider all his personal preferences and would also help with research. He added that Aluz would have to go to a place where he would be very useful, and Aluz thought, repeating this phrase. He asked if he would be called when there were urgent calls. The Governor General did not answer, but only closed his eyes, and Aluz understood everything. He thought it was a compromise and noted that he had never imagined that he would be released just like that. The Governor General said that as soon as everything is ready, he will give Aluz instructions, and until then he will be in reserve. Aluz left the office, and the governor general looked after him sadly. When Aluz left, the governor general put his elbows on the table and tiredly leaned his head against his folded hands. He knew that this day would come one day, and he thought that Aluz had never received an education, so now was the time. The governor general noted that Aluz had already become the strongest, and decided that he should give him the education he had missed as quickly as possible. The Governor General hoped that Aluz would change his mind about leaving, and thought that he no longer needed to give him orders. Some time later in Alpha at the Second Magic Academy, students were walking around the courtyard, talking cheerfully, and Aluz looked at it with displeasure. He mentally scolded the General, thought that he had sent him to school, where he would have to pretend with all his friends. Looking around dissatisfied, Aluz walked along the courtyard of the Academy, thinking that when he hears about the students of the Magic Academy, it immediately comes to mind that most of them hypocritically say that defending the homeland is above all, as well as other nonsense, so he doesn't like them. Aluz asked if there were other places where he could be useful. He remembered that the research building was in the direction he went, and thought that he wanted to spend his time there. Suddenly the wind blew and Aluz saw a ribbon, which he caught in his hands. 
A girl ran up to him and apologized, explaining that it had flown away when she was trying to tie it up. She asked if Alouz was a new student. He confirmed this and asked if she was also a new student. The girl said that it was so and explained that she had arrived too early, so she did not know what to do. Alouz realized that they were the same age and noted that this was already annoying him. Suddenly, a girl appeared behind Alouz and called out to Alice. She came closer to them and Alice joyfully exclaimed her name. Tesfia said that they could already go to the hall for the entrance ceremony, so Alice suggested that they go there quickly. Aria asked Tesfi to wait a little, but Alouz at that moment turned around and said that he had to go, deciding that he needed to leave as soon as possible. Alice turned to Alouz and, waving goodbye to him, said that they would see each other at the ceremony. He waved his hand without turning around, thinking that he wouldn't come anyway. Alouz decided that he needed to quickly find a room and entered the academy. Passing by the students, he thought that it was very noisy here, and finally finding the right room, he opened the door and went inside. He found himself in a spacious room with soft sofas, a table, and shelves with books. The room was two stories high, and one of the walls consisted almost entirely of windows. Alouz looked in surprise at the beautifully decorated interior and, noting that it was incredible, asked if this was really his room. He saw the equipment necessary for research and said that all the equipment was also in place. Alus went up to the second floor of the room and, going up to the bookcases, ran his hand along the spines of the books. Taking one book, he opened it and, thinking, decided that if he did not have enough knowledge for research, he could use the library. Alus decided that this was the best place to study magic. At this moment, the clock showed noon and Alus noted that the entrance ceremony was about to begin. He thought that most students join the army after graduation, and approaching the huge window, he noted that he had already worked there. Alouz assumed that there was no way he could escape the army anyway, but decided that he had no reason to complain since he had the opportunity to lead a relatively good life here. Suddenly the door opened and Alouz, turning around in surprise, saw black shadows enter the room. Out of this came a woman who said she was pleased to meet Alouz. She explained with a smile that she was the chairman of this academy, and her name was Sisti Nixofia. Sisti, smiling a little and tilting her head to the side, invited Alouz to make friends. Alouz thought that she was scary, but said out loud that he knew everything. He remembered that Sisti had already retired from the army, and now he understood why she was called a witch, despite her age and appearance. Alouz said that he wanted to introduce himself to her after he had settled in a little, but he didn't have time to finish because Sisti suddenly came up to him and stood so close that their noses were almost touching. Alouz thought it was very close, but outwardly did not show his surprise. Sisti leaned even closer, and Alouz called her name with a questioning intonation. She stepped back and noted with a smile that Alouz was indeed a high magician, since that was not enough to scare him. She admitted that she was very happy about this, and Alouz coughed and said that he had heard that Sisti had earned great achievements while she was the only active one. Sisti admitted a little sadly that she had been there for a very short time and was only in ninth place, and added that something else was more important. She asked why Alouz didn't come to the entrance ceremony. Alouz sighed and admitted that he only wanted to do research, so he was not going to attend classes like the other students. He closed his eyes and noted that he didn't have time to play friends with them. Sisti smiled and asked if this was true. She explained that this was prohibited because the general had said that if Alouz ignored his lessons, he would immediately return to duty. Alouz frowned and asked again, mentally calling the governor an old man and thinking that he was a real tyrant. Sisti asked Alouz to relax and said that if he at least rarely went to class and did his homework, he would receive decent money. Alouz agreed with this and Sisti, Putting her finger forward, added that Alouz's rank is an indicator of his strength, so she advised him to hide it in order to avoid awkward situations. Alouz admitted that he does not have the habit of showing this to everyone, because this way there are always fewer problems. Sisti agreed with this, and going to the door, said that then she would go, and added that if Alouz had any questions, he should come to her office. She wished him a good day, and, already leaving the room, asked him to lead a full school life. Sisti closed the door, and Alouz just stood there for a while, looking displeased at the closed door, and then closed his eyes, thinking about his time. A short time later, Alouz stood on the roof and, leaning his elbows on the stone partition that served as a railing, watched what was happening below. 
He thought that this academy enrolls about 400 new students every year who choose the lectures to attend according to the major they have enrolled in. He looked at the students standing in rows in front of the targets, practicing attacking it, and remembered that he started attending classes after three weeks of training. Thinking about it, Alouz noted that if he had never shown up for class the previous week, it was unlikely that he would have had enough attendance to remain in the academy. A little later, he entered the classroom and, looking around, noted that this was his classroom. Two male students were talking about what happened during practice, and at that moment Alouz walked past them and they looked at him. One of them asked, who is this newcomer? They assumed that this was the guy who had not attended classes since the beginning of training. The students decided that even if he is very rich, he does not seem particularly motivated to study. They noted that Alouz seemed annoyed, so they decided not to touch him. Alouz threw the textbook onto an empty desk and, sitting down at the table, opened the book and began to carefully study it. The two guys who had previously been talking about Alouz looked at him displeased, and at that moment Alice approached him and wished Alouz good morning. She said that this was not the first time they had met, but decided to introduce herself and said that her name was Alice Adrak. She smiled and remembered that his name was Alouz Regin and asked if that was correct. Alouz, not distracted from reading the book, confirmed this, and Alice suggested that he had not been feeling well before. She added that, in any case, she was glad to see him again, and Alouz said indifferently that he was just relaxing and did not think that there would be any lectures here that would be useful for him. He added that it turned out to be much better than he expected, and also noted that Alice was a little distracting, so he said that he would be grateful if she would stop paying attention to him. Larissa was surprised by these words and awkwardly asked Alouz for forgiveness, and after that she lowered her head down, very upset by what she heard. Tesfia suddenly approached them, who said displeasedly that Alice was just worried about him, that's why she came up. She took Alice's hand and asked Alouz what was wrong with his attitude. She asked who he was, what did he think. Alouz raised his head, asking for forgiveness and telling Alice to just not worry about him in the future. Alice said that she also apologized for coming up so unexpectedly, and Tesfia indignantly asked why Alice was apologizing. She soon calmed down and said that she was from the Fable family, and her name was Tesfia Fable. She explained that she was an aristocrat and called Alouz by her name, so she asked if it was not kind of her. He noted that aristocrats liked to impose their manners on other people, and asked whether this could be called arrogance. Alouz said that they were aristocrats after all, and Tesfia asked what he was even talking about. Alouz said his name and said that he didn't care about Tesfia and her kindness, and Tesfia asked with horror if he really didn't care. She remembered what Alouz said about arrogance, and displeasedly asked what was wrong with his character. Suddenly someone said that the bell had already rung, so everyone should take their seats, and Alice took the angry Tesfia aside. The teacher approached the table in the center of the hall and asked everyone to take their seats, because the lesson had already begun. The man showed a small rectangular map, explaining that students were supposed to be given a magic license when they joined them. He said that this is issued to all magicians working for the state, and added that if you direct it into the magical stream, the rank of the magician will be displayed on the license. The teacher explained that rank depends on individual strength, which affects the magical power and quality of it. He added that, in other words, it was a ranking of their magical abilities. The students tried to place the licenses in their magic flow, and were surprised to see Alice and Tesfia, who only had four digits, although the others had six digits. The teacher explained that both of the girls had outstanding test scores, and added that there was even an examiner who had a hard time with them. He asked the other students not to be sad because they only had six numbers, and suddenly, looking at Alouz, he interrupted his words and, turning to him, asked what happened to his license. Alouz apologized and explained that he had lost it, and the students were very surprised when they heard his words. And he went back to reading the book and thought that the director told him to keep his power a secret so he wouldn't have to worry about it if he accidentally lost his license. Tesfia turned to him and asked if it was possible that he was ashamed to show his rank to others. She said it was no big deal if he only had six digits and Alouz called her stupid. Tesfia looked at him in bewilderment and then asked again indignantly and shouted at him to just show his rank if he was so confident in himself. Alouz sighed displeasedly and the teacher asked them to make noise and sit quietly. The student boys who were sitting not far from Alouz looked at him displeasedly and assumed that he had a bad rank. 
One of them told Alouz to stop going to lessons if he was not so interested. He suddenly remembered that the next lesson was a practical battle and, grinning, offered to show a master class to this stupid child. After the end of the lesson, in the women's locker room, Alice, changing clothes, asked Tesfia not to worry about this lesson and added that she was sure that Tesfia would be surprised to see her favorite weapon. In the men's locker room, Alouz, meanwhile, simply sat on the bench while the other students watched him with displeasure. Soon, in a large hall covered with a glass dome, the teacher noted that everything was already here. He announced that this was Lily's Palace, a training dome for practical battles. The teacher explained that in this training zone, physical pain is replaced by mental pain. That is, in other words, if the students cannot bear the pain, then they will lose. He also added that in practical battles, the use of magical arts and weapons is allowed, and students are required to incorporate magic into their techniques. The teacher said that in today's battles they would use the hour, and said that, as many of them know, it is an auxiliary weapon for battle mages who wish to replace their own magical constructs. He announced that it was allowed to use their own hour, but for those who did not have it, they prepared school ones. Alice called out to Tesfia and invited her to go, but she asked Alice to wait and, drawing her weapon, exclaimed that it was her own hour. The students were surprised that he already had her own hour, and Tesfia explained with a smile that this weapon was passed down in her family, and therefore it was closest to her. Alouz looked displeasedly at Tesfia and asked if this was a katana. He thought that such an old-fashioned weapon really suited a noblewoman, and noting that it was very boring here, he remembered that he had hoped that today would be more interesting. He didn't have time to finish his thoughts when suddenly he was called out by one of the students, who smugly asked if Alouz would agree to a duel with him. He promised that everything would be fine, and adding that they were fellow students, he suggested that they get along. Alouz looked at the guy and noted that he was just a five-digit guy. He remembered that he wanted to read a book, but this guy really didn't understand him, so he finally agreed. The guy asked him to stop for a moment and asked if he even had a weapon. Alouz lifted up the book he was holding in his hands and said that this was his weapon. The guy laughed and asked if he was really going to counter hour with a simple book. He exclaimed that it was great and promised that he would make Alouz his shaving bag. Alice looked at Alouz in horror and noted that it was just a book, and Alouz said that the guy should attack whenever he wants, because he just wants to get back to reading as quickly as possible. The student began to attack and promised that he would then finish it as quickly as possible. He swung his weapon, delivering a blow, but Alouz easily dodged it. The student looked at Alouz with displeasure, and after that he delivered another blow, from which Alouz again dodged. Seeing this, the guy shouted for Alouz to show at least a little courage. Alouz looked at the guy and noted that he was terrible at fencing and his striking balance was incredibly poor and there was no grace or style, so it would be difficult to fake a defeat. The guy called Alouz and said smugly that since he is so quick, he will show him one of his most powerful techniques. He concentrated and summoned the magic that resided within him and cast the fire sword spell. Light shone around the blade of the sword, and Alouz thought that even though the guy tried to make this technique into something of a high rank, it was still a simplified form of a higher rank technique. He was incredibly embarrassed to watch the student boast with such a smug face. Other students watching the fight actively supported their comrade, and Alouz, looking at them, noted that this was only a type of magic, but thought that they did not understand anything else. Looking at the grinning guy opposite him, Alouz thought that the time had come, because he looked motivated. He decided that the time had come to end this game and, raising his hand with the book in front of him, suggested that we end it. He activated the magic and the book began to shine, and the guy raised his hand, called Alouz and began to strike. Alouz covered himself with a book, and when the student's sword hit it, it became very light around and the guys disappeared under the suddenly appearing smoke. Alice looked at this in horror, and when the smoke cleared, she screamed Alouz's name, noticing that he was lying on the floor. She sat down on her knees next to him and asked if he was okay. Alice asked if Alouz was conscious. In desperation, she asked him to answer, and suddenly Alouz opened his eyes and sat down with an indifferent expression on his face, which greatly frightened Alice. He put his hand on his shoulder and said that there was no problem, because it was impossible to get physically injured on this training ground. Alice realized that he was right, and Alouz picked up his book. The student Alouz was fighting smugly asked if it was right that he won. Alouz confirmed this and congratulated his opponent, noting that he was in a hurry to lose. 
He looked at the cheering students and thought that even though he had engineered the defeat, he had made sure that no one would realize that the attack had been deliberately taken by him. Aluz assumed that he did everything well and noted that studying at school is very difficult. After the end of the fight, Aluz sat on the floor, leaning against the wall, and turning to Alice, asked if that was her name. He realized that her turn would soon come and asked if he had said it right. Alice confirmed this and explained that she was only studying here for the first year and had little combat experience, so she could not let her guard down. Aluz expressed hope that Alice would win and she looked at him in surprise and Aluz explained that he lost but tried his best. Alice thanked him and asked him not to overdo it even if he was not hurt. Aluz said he would do so and Alice left. Aluz tiredly threw his head back and rested the back of his head on the wall behind him. He decided that he had said it without thinking and assumed that he was still a little tired. He remembered the moment when Alice ran up to him after a training fight with another guy and asked if she was worried about him that time. Aluz closed the book and noted that manners are a strange thing. He decided that it wouldn't be so terrible to watch a little battle and turned his attention to what was happening in the hall. Alice stood with a serious and concentrated look in front of another student who was sitting on one knee, ready to attack. Alice held a blade in her hand on a long wooden handle. At this moment, the guy who was supposed to fight Ollie's frowned and ran towards Ollie's, and she swung her weapon. However, the guy dodged, and Alice hit the floor with the blade. The student swung his hand and, clenching his fist, began to strike with brass knuckles put on his hand. Alice stopped this attack by holding the hilt of the weapon in front of her and was able to push the guy back. While he looked at her in bewilderment, Alice swung her hand and hit the guy in the chest with the blunt side of her weapon. He closed his eyes and grabbed his sore head with his hand. Alice thought that this was a very good place that replaced physical pain with mental pain. The student clenched his hand into a fist and magic arrows appeared behind him and he exclaimed that he would see how Alice dealt with this. The guy waved his hand, and the arrows flew towards Alice, who noted that this was an entry-level magic ice arrow. Alice thought, if so, then she will do something else. She put her hands in front of her and activated her magic. A luminous circle appeared in front of Alice, which served as something like a shield and reflected the guy's arrows aimed at Alice. Alice was victorious in this fight, and the students watching this were very surprised and delighted. They surrounded Alice and started talking to her, and Aluz, watching this, looked at Alice's weapon and remembered that it was a Najinata. He noted that she also used an old-fashioned weapon, and then remembered the fight between Alice and the other guy, and thought that now it was a light seal reflection, but he corrected his thoughts and decided that he would even say that it was a redirection. Aluz was sure that this was not a skill that an ordinary student could learn. He guessed that Alice only had four digits. Aluz thought that the main magic was divided into the elements of Earth, water, fire, wind, ice, and lightning, but there were also magics such as light and darkness. He noted that most attributes can be simply learned, but light magic is not one of these and requires a person to possess it from birth. Aluz remembered that light is a rather rare type, so it is surprising that Alice has such power. At that moment, Tesfia approached Alice and said that this was her girl. Tesfia looked at Alice proudly, and Alice, noticing her approach, joyfully shouted out Tesfia's name. She suggested stopping the fighting shortly and starting training, and added that training with mana purification would be the most useful for increasing the amount of mana. Alan turned away from the students, suggesting that now would be a good time to get back to reading. But suddenly something flashed from the side of Aluz, and he noticed how Tesfia, who approached him from behind, put her weapon to Aluz's neck. She seriously asked Aluz to give her a minute, and Alice, who approached Tesfia, asked her to stop. Tesfia remarked displeasedly that this would be a good lesson for Aluz, and he, putting his hands in his pockets, noted that Tesfia would not calm down. He said that she constantly steals his time, and added that it would be better if Tesfia cared so much about herself. Tesfia asked if he really thought he could get away with it so easily. She remembered how Aluz told her that aristocrats like to impose their manners on other people, and Aluz asked in bewilderment what he did. Tesfia became very angry because of this and, pointing her finger at Aluz, asked him not to say that he had already forgotten about his words. Aluz thought for a moment and suddenly realized what Tesfia was talking about. He looked at her indifferently and asked what was wrong. Tesfia asked if he really said what. She clenched her weapon free hand into a fist and shouted that he should not dare to say that, 
because he could not even imagine what it meant to have such a name. She said that she could not ignore this and simply could not allow this to happen. Alouz thought that Tesfia was already tired of distracting him from reading and admitted his mistake. He asked Tesfia to simply stop communicating with him, and Tesfia, coming closer to Alouz, took the book from his hands and, throwing it aside, told him not to act like a fool. Alice shouted Tesfia's name in displeasure. Tesfia moved a little away from Alouz and pulled out her weapon from its case. She seriously told Alouz to fight her, and Alouz, leaving Tesfia's words unanswered, walked up to the book lying on the floor and, crouching on one knee, picked it up. Finally, he said that he would then set conditions. He said that this should be a fight between Tesfia and himself only, asking not to invite others. Opening the book, Alouz noted that Tesfia was very rough with precious documents, so he was not going to kindly give up. As he spoke these words, Alouz frowned. Some time later, Sisti asked in surprise if Alouz was really going to fight the daughter of the Favel family after class. Alouz sat on the sofa in Sisti's office and said that he would give in a little, because he would not seriously fight with the child. Sisti smiled and, mentally repeating the word child, asked if Alouz would save her from unnecessary problems. She asked if he could just ignore Tesfi. Alouz put the cup of drink on the saucer and replied that he could not do it. He noted that practical battles between students come first in this school, so if they try to make peace, the problem will only become bigger. Alouz added that his already small amount of free time was occupied by such things, and he no longer wanted to waste the rest of it on other useless activities. Sisti said thoughtfully that even though he said that, she was worried. She thought since the physical pain from magical attacks is replaced by mental pain, everything will be fine, but Alouz is a one-digit magician, and if he wants it, he can drive his opponent crazy. Eventually, Sisti smiled and gave permission, asking Alouz to go easy on Tesfia. Alouz said that he would do so, and suddenly turning to Sisti, he asked if he could borrow it. Sisti said she didn't mind. A little later, Alouz entered the room and looked at a small flat suitcase lying on the table. He came closer and, opening the special locks on it, looked a little sadly at his weapon lying in the suitcase. Some time later, one of the girls in the group of students said that after this they would have a session, so she asked if Alice and Tesfia would like to join. Alice apologized with a smile and said that they already had some things to do, so she said that they would do it, maybe some other time. Tesfia and Alice continued to walk down the corridor, with Tesfia walking slightly ahead with a concentrated look. Alice looked at her worriedly and asked if she would really do this. Tesfia admitted that she knew that she had overdone it a little, and also that the weight that the name Favel carries did not matter to Alouz. Alice wanted to say something, but Tesfia interrupted her words and seriously said that after all, those who insult her efforts and pride cannot be forgiven so easily. At this time, Alouz had already arrived at the training hall and mentally noted that he had arrived too early. He looked back and saw Sisti standing in the stands and wondered if she was watching him. Alouz thought that someone else had come to see this spectacle and noted that he did not see this person, which meant that he at least had three digits. He guessed that this man was here at Sisti's request and thought it was difficult to relax under such surveillance. Someone suddenly asked if they really made him wait. Alouz turned around and saw a serious Tesfia and a worried Alice who entered the hall. Tesfia said that she thought that Alouz would be scared and not come, and Alouz asked to skip all this nonsense and told Tesfia to warm up, and they would start. Tesfia suddenly asked in surprise if Alouz would fight this. Alouz, who was holding a small magazine, asked Tesfia not to worry, and she indignantly noted that it was just paper. She asked if he was serious about fighting with this. Tesfia exclaimed that she did not agree with this, and Alouz thought that he borrowed this from the director, however, it would be more than enough against Tesfia. Tesfia thought displeasedly that Alouz really liked to humiliate people, and Alouz meanwhile said that before they start, he has conditions. He said when he wins, Tesfia will stop showing up in front of him. Tesfia said that this would only happen if he won, and added that if he wanted, then she, as a four-digit rank, could take care of his studies. Alouz replied that this was already unnecessary, and Tesfia, saying that this was wonderful, said that if she wins, then Alouz will apologize for everything that he said to her. Alouz thought that he assumed he had already done this, but he said out loud that he understood everything. Alice activated the required training room mode, and Tesfia said that she was giving the start signal. Alice looked at the concentrated Tesfia and Alouz and asked if they were ready. She announced that we could begin. 
Tasfia pulled her katana out of its sheath and lunged at Aluz, stabbing him. Aluz dodged, and this continued for some time. Aluz noted that compared to other students, Tasfia moves well, but puts a little more force into the blow than necessary. Aluz continued to dodge each of Tesfia's attacks, and she, after catching her breath, looked at Aluz and said that all he does is run away. Trying to attack again, Tesfia angrily shouted at Aluz to fight as if he wanted to win. Aluz rolled the paper he was holding into a tube and held it out in front of him, stopping Tesfia's weapon. Tesfia looked at the crossed sword and paper with horror and surprise and jumped back, asking how this could happen. She suggested that this was not ordinary paper, but Aluz, having unfolded it, folded it several times, saying that it was the most ordinary. Tesfia pushed off with her foot and ran to attack again, shouting that Aluz was lying. She said that this could not be, and Aluz, again calmly holding out the folded paper in front of him, asked if Tesfia still did not want to give up. Tesfia angrily said that she was able to recently defeat her guards, and Aluz, thinking about it, noted that he had no idea what techniques Tesfia had in store, but it would not be difficult for him to cope with a person of her level. Tesfia jumped, about to deliver a crushing blow, but Aluz stood calmly, not dodging. He said that Tesfia had many open places where he could hit, and, swinging, attacked her in the neck with a rolled-up paper. Tesfia flew back and crashed into the fence with her back, gritting her teeth in pain. Alice called out Tesfia's name in concern. She ran inside the arena, and Tesfia sat on her knees, not understanding how this happened. Aluz looked at her and asked how exactly. He asked Tesfia to admit her defeat, and Tesfia, looking tensely in front of her, mentally asked if she really had to admit that she lost to Aluz. Admit that she lost to a lazy person who disdains the nobility, and a person with a character she hates? Tesfia thought that because of people like him who do not put in any effort, other people have an inferiority complex, and so she worked without rest to become strong and prove it to others. She noted that this had a result, because she could not remember anyone humiliating her. Tesfia remembered her hard training and admitted that she looked down on Aluz. She leaned on the sword as she stood up, and Alice asked her not to fight anymore. Tesfia resolutely said that she would make Aluz apologize, thinking that she did not want to lose to someone like him. She ran her fingers along the blade of the weapon and, shouting that she would not allow Aluz to put an end to all her efforts and training, activated the glacial sword. Tesfia, swinging her katana, sent a huge sword that appeared in the air to attack, and Alice, seeing this, shouted for Aluz to dodge. But Aluz simply touched his fingers to a sword flying at him at high speed, and it crumbled into a large number of pieces with a crash. Tesfia looked at the calm Aluz with fear, and, falling to the floor, said that this could not be. Aluz came closer and waved the paper, and Tesfia, seeing this, lowered her head and closed her eyes. However, Aluz did not hit her too much, and only leaned the rolled-up paper against Tesfi's head. He apologized to her, and admitted that he did not mean to offend her. Tesfia looked at him in surprise, and Aluz added that since she perceived everything this way, it means he is to blame. Tesfia lowered her head and mumbled something awkwardly, and then said more clearly that she was too hot-tempered, so she asked for forgiveness, wiping away the tears that appeared in the corners of her eyes with her finger. Aluz noted that Tesfia was surprisingly honest, and Tesfia exclaimed indignantly that it was because Aluz apologized. She explained that she could not help but answer him in kind, but after that she became sad again and, pressing her knees to her, sadly said that she had lost after all. Aluz thought that Tesfia was a little upset and turned around and said that he had to go, but Tesfia grabbed Aluz by the clothes and asked her to wait. Aluz turned to her and asked what is it. Tesfia asked, confused, how did Aluz do what he did in the end? Aluz said that wizards have an unspoken rule, namely not to ask others about their special or secret techniques. He asked if Tesfia knew about this. Tesfia admitted that she knew and wanted to add something, but interrupted her words when she heard a sound. They turned around and saw Sisti walking towards them. Tesfia said her name in surprise, and Sisti said with a smile that nothing less was expected from the daughter of the Fable family. She thanked Tesfia for the wonderful opportunity to watch such a high-level battle, and Tesfia became embarrassed upon hearing this. Alice asked what brought Sisti here. Sisti explained that Aluz had asked to reserve the gym for him, and she was curious as to why he did it. Aluz shouted her name indignantly, and Tesfia, looking at Aluz, asked who he was. She said that he broke her glacial sword, as if it were some kind of trifle, 
and Sisti said that she was sure that for Aluz it was a trifle. She clarified that she came here to make sure Tesfia was safe, and she asked what Sisti meant by this. Sisti noted that it was better for them to see everything themselves, and approaching Aluz, she said that his license had arrived from headquarters in the morning. She handed it to him and asked if he could show it to Alice and Tesfia. Aluz showed his ID by holding it out on his hand and, activating a magical flow, summoned his rank. The number one appeared, and Tesfia asked in surprise whether he really had the first rank. Sisti noted with a smile that this was a wonderful reaction, and admitted that she was also surprised when she read Aluz's file, which included his merits. Aluz looked displeasedly at Sisti and asked if she wanted to keep his rank a secret. Sisti explained that she thought it would be a good idea to tell Tesfia and Alice about this, so she asked Aluz to believe that this was the fate of fate. After that, she turned to Alice and Tesfia and told them not to tell other students and teachers, otherwise she would personally punish them. Aluz looked thoughtfully at the girls and, noticing Tesfia's shocked state, assumed that Alice was not surprised by this because she stood there, smiling calmly. Hearing this, Alice panicked, and Aluz asked if she was so surprised that she froze. Alice laughed nervously, and Sisti said that now she was interested in something else. She asked Aluz why he studies everything he comes across. Aluz explained that he was doing this to make his life easier and asked what it was. Sisti came closer to him and, putting her hand on Aluz's shoulder, asked him if he thought that if Tesfia and Alice became stronger, wouldn't that make his life easier? Aluz said that this would not work, and Sisti added that this would be the case if they remained ordinary students. Aluz warily asked what she was hinting at. Sisti smiled and announced that Aluz would be trained by Tesfia and Alice. Aluz asked displeasedly. Sisti reiterated that she wanted Aluz to train Alyssa and Tesfia. Aluz said that this is impossible because he does not have the necessary skills. He thought that this was not modesty because he really didn't know how to teach someone something. Sisti winked at him and told him it was okay. She noted that there is no one better in combat practice than Aluz and ominously added, leaning even closer to Aluz, that he was not busy with anything in between studies anyway. Sisti asked what Aluz would say to this. Alice and Tesfia looked at Aluz, and he closed his eyes and guessed that if he ignored Sisti's request now, it would be hard for him later. Aluz sighed and said he would do it. Sisti exclaimed joyfully that she knew Aluz would agree, and Aluz asked if he could go already. Sisti smiled and said that for now it was possible, and Aluz, repeating these words, said that everything was clear to him. He turned around and thought, when it came to negotiations, he couldn't beat Sisti. As Aluz walked away, Tesfia and Alice watched him in surprise. Tesfia said displeasedly that because of someone like Aluz, the end of the world could come. She said that it was impossible to understand the fact that Aluz ran away from the front line to have fun. Sisti stamped her foot, and Tesfia flinched in fear. Sisti turned to Tesfia and Alice, and Tesfia asked herself in horror if she had really said something wrong. Sisti explained that Aluz had seen a lot, and said that no one has complete information about the unambiguous, so it is not surprising that there is such a misunderstanding between them. She added that only these nine people have been given the rank of senior commanders, and no one can give them orders except the Governor General. Sisti also explained that the difference between them and ordinary magicians lies in their mission, because instead of simply killing a monster, they must protect and expand the lands of the kingdom. Sisti smiled and said if they want to become excellent magicians, they should ask Aluz to train them. Alice asked enthusiastically, is it really possible for them? Tesfia asked displeasedly if she really wanted to learn from someone like Aluz. Alice joyfully exclaimed that this was wonderful because he would only teach them. Sisti turned to Tesfia and said that she would not force her, but added that she should know that there were many people who would happily agree to this proposal. Tesfia pressed the weapon to herself and sadly said that she understood everything. Some time later, someone talked about how monsters suddenly appeared about a hundred years ago and asked if they really knew it themselves. It was a teacher who, standing in his place in a large classroom, told students about monsters. He explained that it was divided into ranks based on strength. There are eight ranks in total from F to SS, but in the last 50 years there has only been one confirmed encounter with an SS rank monster. The teacher added that usually a squad of four people is formed to protect the territory from monsters because it is believed that such a squad can cope with unforeseen situations. 
For example, against a class a monster, a squad of three two-digit wizards and one three-digit one is assembled. In the case of ranks B and C, in most cases, the squad consists of three three-digit wizards and one two-digit one, who is the head of the squad, and against monsters of a lower rank, the squad is assembled from three-digit and more inexperienced wizards. He decided to move on to describing other monsters and remembering something named the name Elus. Elus got up from his seat and said that monsters use mana to increase their strength, so they choose among people those who own magic. He added that cases of cannibalism were not uncommon among this, and the teacher sighed, closing his eyes. Elus asked himself, is this really enough? He further revealed that monsters of different types can assimilate with each other, and added that there have been rare cases of monsters increasing in rank after eating humans or the like. Aluz clarified that this applies to lower monsters, which, by absorbing magical energy, change the rank of it. After this, Aluz decided to move on to high-level monsters and announced that it is not afraid of protective walls, which is why the fortifications are weakening every year. Alice and Tesfia, as well as other students, looked at Aluz with fear, and he awkwardly added that this is what scientists say, who came to this conclusion as a result of research. He rubbed his chin with his finger and remembered that no one knew about this information. Aluz turned to the teacher and asked if this was enough. The teacher said that this would be enough, and the students, talking among themselves, asked if these were just rumors. Some time later, the teacher announced that the lesson was over and reminded the students about their homework. Aluz closed his eyes and sighed, and suddenly someone called out to him. He turned around and saw Tesfia approach him, who, placing her hand on Aluz's shoulder, asked him to come with her. Aluz and Tesfia went outside where Alice was already standing, and Aluz asked what they wanted. The girls asked what was that just now. Alice repeated Aluz's phrase that the walls are weakening every year, and asked if this was true. Aluz noted dissatisfiedly, even if this is so, then this does not apply to Alice and Tesfia. Alice asked how is it. She explained that they would be wizards and would also fight monsters, so she asked Aluz not to say such words. Aluz asked, so what? He said that it was none of their business right now, and Tesfia exclaimed that he was wrong. She said seriously, if they don't have time, then it's a shame to rest for three years at school because they have to fight and give all their strength for this. Tesfia said that he should therefore teach them how to fight monsters. Aluz looked at them indifferently and said no. Tesfia looked at Aluz in surprise and, starting to nervously finger a lock of hair, asked why. Alice folded her hands in a pleading gesture and also asked for Aluz. He stood with his elbows relaxed on the railing and promised that he would think about it. Tesfia said indignantly that Aluz could do this, so she asked what was the matter. Aluz asked if she was really an aristocrat. He noted that she didn't know how to ask people for things and added that he was very sorry, but he couldn't waste time on the two of them. Alice said that the director asked him to take care of them, and Aluz, putting his hand on his neck, remembered that there was something like that. He agreed and, looking at Tesfia, asked what she would say. Tesfia lowered her head down and, closing her eyes, grabbed the hem of her skirt with her hands, pretending to bow, and embarrassedly asked if Aluz could become her teacher. For some time, Alice and Aluz simply looked at Tesfius in silence, and in the end Aluz said that this was a great loss for pride. Tesfia was very indignant at this, but Aluz said that he was just joking. He noted that the director asked to take care of them, but added that research is still more important. He admitted that he didn't care whether they became sorceresses or not, and Tesfia stood next to him, leaned her elbows on the railing, and said that he wouldn't know until he tried. She asked, what if they become stronger than him? Aluz explained that this was not the case, and asked if they considered themselves good magicians. Tesfia said that it was so, and Aluz said that he was not talking about that. He explained that a good wizard is not someone who can fight with all his might, and asked if they really haven't fought monsters yet. Aluz said that some people become useless when they see this, and it only takes one time for a person to begin to fear the outside world. Aluz promised that he would become their teacher and make them stronger, but warned that this might be useless. Tesfir repeated that you won't know anything until you try and Aluz mentally told her to think better about her comrades, because she should be useful in a real battle. Tesfia suddenly said that she had thought of something. She said that the names Aluz and Alisa are easy to get confused, so she asked if she could give Aluz a nickname. Aluz told her to do it, and Tesfia smiled and asked what his nickname was Al. She explained that he was Aluz, and therefore Al.
Aluz told her to call him what she liked, and Alice exclaimed that it sounded good and added that she liked to say it that way. Tesfia said that it was then decided, and Aluz, turning to Alice, added that she need not address him so formally, because, in the end, he too is not worried about it. Alice asked, Is it possible to do this? She admitted that she was very happy about this, and explained that she felt that there was awkwardness between them. Tesfia told Alice that they would then go to lunch, and returning inside the academy, the girls thanked Aluz, promising that they would see each other after classes. When Alice and Tesfia left, Aluz repeated his new nickname and, smiling, noted that it was selfish. Sometime later, they asked him displeasedly if this was his first time here. Aluz, standing in the dining room, confirmed that this was so, and the saleswoman told him to stand there as long as he wanted, but she would not give him anything. She explained that first you need to take a food coupon, but not here, but from a special machine. Aluz asked in surprise, and the saleswoman showed him a huge line of students. Aluz looked at this in horror, but still stood in line. After some time, Aluz finally approached the machine and thought that he wanted to look around in the dining room, but everything did not go according to plan. He looked at the machine in surprise and asked what it was. Aluz remembered that in the army canteen, they simply took a tray and left what they wanted for it, and asked himself, is it really so difficult in all schools? Tesfia suddenly approached him and asked what Aluz was doing. She came closer and asked if he had never used the vending machines. Aluz admitted that he knew about the existence of this, but had never seen it, and after that he asked, is it really possible that everyone who does not understand machine guns is kicked out onto the street? Tesfia clicked on the right places on the machine and asked what Aluz had been doing before. Finally, she said that all that was left was to pay the fee, and Aluz asked displeasedly whether he really had to pay for it as well. Tesfia was surprised by these words and asked if Aluz was normal. He admitted that until then he had managed just fine without it, and Tesfia was dissatisfied and said that this was an elite establishment, so no one would just give Aluz food, so if he wants to eat, he must pay money. She exclaimed that it was obvious and sighed, adding that here you can pay by credit card, so if he has a license, he can do it. Aluz admitted that he did not take his license with him, and Tesfia asked if he had never made purchases on the premises of the academy. Aluz admitted that he simply did not buy coupons from the machines, and after that he added that Tesfia and Alice showed his rank, but did not take the license from the director. Tesfia noted that this was a problem, and Aluz admitted that he did not have a single coin. Tesfia asked again in surprise, and then took out her license and leaned it against the machine. Aluz asked if she was sure. Tesfia said that it was better to end this as soon as possible, and thought that if they found out about this, trouble could not be avoided. Tesfia leaned closer to Aluz and told him not to attract too much attention in order to keep the secret. She asked if the director said that. Aluz remembered that she had said so, and taking the coupon from Tesfia, apologized and promised that he would return the money. Tesfia said that there was no need to do this because she was just paying off a debt. Aluz mentally asked again, but wondered out loud if Tesfia would have lunch. He asked what she was doing here otherwise. Tesfia pointed to another place, located at the opposite end of the corridor, and said that she should go there. Aluz remembered that she was an aristocrat and asked if she could have problems with money. He suddenly thought that it was better not to say such a thing in front of Tesfia, otherwise problems would start again but Tesfia calmly said that Aluz did not understand everything correctly. She explained with a smile that before enrolling she had said too much to her mother, so she lives on a scholarship and needs to plan everything carefully. Aluz understood what was going on and thought that he had assumed that Tesfia was impenetrable, but it turns out that she can smile. Tesfia suddenly said that she knew everything, and stopping near the window, touched the glass with her fingers and explained that Aluz had succumbed to her in a training battle. Aluz began to deny it, but Tesfia said that it was four-digit, and did not immediately understand, however, after thinking a little, she guessed. She said that today's dinner was her debt for that time, and Aluz understood what kind of debt it was. He noted that Tesfia was on her own, and said out loud that, in that case, he would gladly accept it. Tesfia told him to be nice and smiled. She suddenly looked at Tesfia and, noticing his thoughtful look, asked if something was wrong. She asked him to immediately say if he didn't like something, and Aluz said, if you look at it like that, then she's very nice. Tesfia was shocked by these words and asked again in surprise. Out of surprise, she even dropped her license and, squatting down to pick it up, she said that she shouldn't say something like that so suddenly. 
Aluz said thoughtfully that she was beautiful and all guys love beautiful girls. He admitted that these were just his thoughts, and approaching Tesfia, who was still squatting without getting up, he asked if she was okay. Tesfia was very embarrassed by Alu's words, and therefore sat with her license pressed thoughtfully to her mouth. She suddenly exclaimed indignantly that Alu should not say such nonsense, and Alu said in bewilderment that he praised her. Tesfia told him to shut up and asked Alu to get ready, promising that she was going to learn a lot from him. Aluz mentally noted that Tesfia had turned on the aristocratic girl again. Sometime later, Aluz was sitting in his room on one knee, trying to find something in the chest of drawers on the floor. Finally, he found the desired item, and smiling, said that he was not mistaken when he took it with him. He turned to Tesfia and Alice, who were looking around in surprise, and seriously said that they would start training. The item Aluz was looking for turned out to be a wooden block. Tesfia suddenly closed her eyes and asked Aluz to wait. She asked what this huge room was. Aluz asked what she was talking about. He explained that this room was for research, and at the same time his home. Aluz added that even he lives in a dormitory, but said that it was nothing unusual, given his achievements. He asked Tesfia and Alice to walk carefully, and asked if they really wanted to ruin everything for him here. The girls wanted to say something, and Aluz, turning to them, asked them to listen and explained that he would only teach them how to fight monsters. He admitted that he did not know whether they would increase their rank as a result of training, but added that it was useless to just sit and wait. Tesfia and Alice looked at each other in confusion, and Aluz assumed that he had confused them. Aluz sat down on one of the sofas and asked how they think the rank is calculated. Tesfia asked to let her think and said that this was the power of magic, the ability to use high-level techniques, and the number of successfully completed missions. Aluz said that it was close, but not everything yet. He explained what Tesfia had said correctly and asked what she thought was the most important of the three. Tesfia suggested that it was the power of magic and spells, and Alice admitted that she also thought so. Aluz said that this is not so, and said that the most important indicator is the number of monsters defeated and the rank of it. He explained that when a high-level monster is destroyed, the rank increases much faster, although students do not have the opportunity to hunt monsters anyway. Alu said that this is why he will teach them skills that can raise their ranks in the future. He admitted that he wouldn't mind if they forgot about ranks and focused on other things. Tesfia exclaimed that it was not a matter of high rank because they just wanted to become stronger and asked Alice if that was true. Alice confirmed this and Alu, saying that they would begin then, threw the object he found earlier into the air and cut it with his hand. The girls looked at this in surprise, and Aluz said that first he would teach them how to absorb magical energy. The girls asked what he did. Aluz explained that this was also the absorption of magic, and they exclaimed in surprise that they had not seen any magic. Aluz admitted that he would not be a magician with one sign if they could just see it, and thought that nothing could be done and would have to explain. He picked up a piece of paper from the table and, folding it, asked Tesfia and Alice to watch carefully. He brought two fingers to one end of the paper and cut it. Tesfia said that this was indeed the case and wanted to say something, but Alice interrupted her words, asking how Aluz cut it. He explained that absorbing magic can significantly increase the strength of an object, but it makes no sense to concentrate energy in one's own body. Aluz said that, for example, when covering a fist with magic, most of it will be absorbed into the body, and if nothing is done, traces in the form of haze will remain on the skin. He admitted that cutting paper with a hand is not so easy, and said, to make it clear, he would demonstrate it with Tesfia's katana. Tesfia hesitantly handed Aluz her weapon, and he, taking it out of the case, showed the blade, around which a dim light shone. He explained that this is what they do unconsciously, and this is what they do consciously. Tesfia and Alice looked closer at the blade and saw a layer of magic appear around it. Tesfia exclaimed in surprise, and Aluz explained that the energy spreads along the blade and completely envelops the blade, and this can give the blade a certain shape. Tesfia exclaimed with joy and asked if they could also distribute energy along the blade. Aluz said that this was not the main thing, because he only clearly showed them the possibilities of using this spell. Tesfia sat down on her knees and put her hands on the table, lowered her head and sadly thought that they also wanted it that way. Aluz, meanwhile, explained that he did the same thing with his hand. That is, in other words, he does not just cover the finger with magic, but gives it the shape of a blade. Alice asked how is this possible. 
Alu said if you master this skill, you can easily become double digit, and thought whether Alice and Tesfia could handle, it was a different matter. He showed them the wooden block he had found earlier, and said that they would now move on to something else. The block in Alu's hands began to burn, and he said that with the help of this stick, he would teach Alice and Tesfia to transfer energy into objects. He warned that this was their first test, and if they failed, they might consider themselves eaten by monsters. He handed Alice and Tesfia each a block and asked them to try it. Alice looked at it in surprise, and Alouz explained that this was not a simple stick, but a trophy he had obtained from a monster. Tesfia and Alice looked at Alouz in surprise and dropped the sticks from their hands, and Alouz said indignantly that this was the most valuable material in the world. Tesfia wanted to say something, but Alouz interrupted her words and asked her not to worry, because he himself had trained with this for a long time, so there would be no problems. He added that if they were so disgusted, then they could leave, because he didn't mind that. Alice and Tesfia again took the sticks in their hands, and Alouz, relaxing with his back on the sofa, asked them to try to charge the artifact with magical energy. The girls said they would do it, and Alouz grinned as he watched them intently try to do what he asked them to do. Tesfia suddenly stopped and asked in surprise whether the magic had really been reflected. Alouz explained that it was a special monster that could dissipate magic along the core of it. Alice asked in bewilderment how to transfer energy to them then. Alouz asked, isn't this clear? He pointed his finger at the table and explained that they must take the artifact and hold the transferred energy. Tesfia asked again, and Alice admitted that she had never done this before, so she asked what they should do. Alouz stood up and asked them to stretch out their hands. Alice also stood up and said that they would do it, but asked what he was planning. Alouz grabbed the hands of Tesfia and Alice and pinched their wrists. They screamed that they were hurt, and Tesfia asked displeasedly what he was doing. Alouz asked them to concentrate energy in their legs. He thought that magical energy is generated and distributed throughout the body as needed, and usually magic is automatically concentrated in the hand, so many control it unconsciously, but if you pinch the wrist, the pain will cause the magic to gather elsewhere, and then you can control it yourself. Soon, magical energy flowed from their feet to their hands again, no matter how hard they tried. Alouz asked what is this. He told Alice and Tesfia, who had closed their eyes, that they were of no use and they were really four-digit. Alouz thought he didn't care about the survival of the human race, but he was surprised. He sighed, and Tesfia, rubbing the place where Alouz had pinched her, seriously thought that she would learn right away. Alouz said that he was returning to his research, and Tesfia asked if he was already leaving. Alouz, without turning around, said that there were two of them, so they could pinch each other. He told them to call him when they learned, and Tesfia desperately asked him to at least give them a hint. Alouz thought for a moment, but then said that there would be no mercy. A little later, when it was already dark, Alouz was walking down the street followed by Tesfia and Alice. Tesfia asked Alice to pinch her harder, and Alouz suddenly told her to look somewhere. Tesfia asked in surprise, and at that moment she crashed into a lamppost. She squatted down, clutching her aching head, and exclaimed that she needed to be warned that there was a lantern here. Alice sat down next to her and asked if she was okay. Tesfia replied that everything was fine, and Alouz, holding his hand by the neck, said that the monster would not warn them about anything, so he advised them not to concentrate too much on absorbing magic, otherwise they would die before they could blink. Tesfia and Alice stood up and followed Alouz again, but Tesfia continued to hold her head. Finally, they reached the right place, and Tesfia leaned her license against a special scanner, and Alice thanked Alouz for guiding them. She said that they would see each other at school, and Alouz, confirming this, looked at the building they approached and asked himself, was this really a girl's dormitory? He saw a scanner for checking cards, as well as cameras, and compared this security to security in a prison. Alouz admitted that it was too different from the men's dormitory, and Alice was surprised by these words. As she was about to go inside, Tesfia thanked Alouz for today's training and said that they were counting on him tomorrow. Alouz agreed with this and said that as soon as they learn to do everything correctly, he will begin to teach them further, but did not have time to finish his words, noticing something. Tesfia, continuing to look at Alouz, mentally asked again, but suddenly buried herself in someone's chest. Alice looked at the girl who appeared in front of them and exclaimed that she was the dormitory leader. The headwoman congratulated Alice and Tesfia on their return, and noticing Alouz, asked who it was. He said that he was a first-year student, Alouz Raijin, 
and he was helping Alice and Tesfia study and did not notice how it got dark. The head girl looked at him and said that such efforts were even encouraged by the students. She introduced herself as a sophomore, and her name was Farinella Scalant. Aluz was surprised to hear her last name, but said out loud that she was a second-year student, but already a prefect. Tesfia proudly said that despite the fact that Farinella is a second-year student, she is one of the three-digit mages. She also added that their families maintained good relations, so they had known each other for a long time. Alou said that this was impressive, but Farinella said that this was not so, because she was only rank 375. Alou's remembered who she was and said that he had caused them a lot of trouble. He asked how Mr. Vizist was doing. Farinella looked at him in surprise, and then smiled and said that everything was fine. She added that her father was also interested in Alou's progress, and Tesfia asked if Farinella really knew Alou. Farinella turned to Alice and Tesfia and said that she knew him. She admitted that she was seeing Alouz for the first time, but her father talked a lot about him. Farinella asked if Alouz helps them with their training. Alouz thought, since Farinella is the daughter of Viseist, it is not surprising that her speech is a little strange. He said dissatisfiedly that the director forced him to do this, and Farinella admitted that she was even jealous. Alouz added that they could continue to stay late, so he asked Farinella not to be too strict with Tesfia and Alice. Farinella said that he could call her fairy. Aluz agreed with this. I told Farinella to call him Al in this case, because Tesfia and Alice call him that. Farinella was embarrassed and said that she was very grateful, but could not easily switch to informal speech. She asked if it would be difficult for him if she still called him Aluz. Aluz said that everything was fine, and Farinella asked Alice and Tesfia to also call her simply by her name, because, after all, they are not strangers. Tesfia and Alice nodded, and Aluz, putting his hand on his neck, turned around and said that he had to go. Farinella called out to him and said that Alice and Tesfia were still girls, so she asked him to try not to delay them too much. Aluz agreed to this, and Farinella hesitantly asked if she could ask him to look after her sometimes. Aluz looked at Farinella and said that he didn't care, because two or three didn't matter. He asked if Farinella was sure that this would only happen sometimes. She exclaimed that she was sure and Aluz, closing his eyes, admitted that he did not think that he would help her very much, since she was already on her way to a double-digit rank. Farinella smiled and said that she would not hope for much, but would look forward to their training with all her heart. Alice and Tesfia waved goodbye to Aluz, and Tesfia said that they would see each other tomorrow. Aluz, without turning around, waved back, and Farinella thought about Aluz, and assumed that she would never be able to call him just Al, at least because of her father's position. She closed her eyes and sadly thought that this was terrible, and she really regretted it. Tesfia and Alice called out to Farinella, and she said it was time to go to their rooms. Tesfia and Alice agreed with this. Sometime later, Aluz was sitting at his desk, surrounded by huge stacks of books and papers, and after looking at his watch, he got up from his chair and decided to go check on Alice and Tesfia. He saw that they were still pinching each other, sitting on the sofa, and was surprised to note that he thought that today would be like yesterday, and did not expect that they would progress so much. Alice and Tesfia's legs glowed a little, because they managed to concentrate magical energy into it, and Aluz thought that they quickly learned how to control the flow of magic, although it usually takes a long time. He came closer to Alice and Tesfia, and said what they were doing was wrong. Aluz advised them to concentrate on their fingertips and thought that after interacting with his magic, it would become easier for them to work with their magic. He extended his hand over Tesfia's and Alice's, and Alice bowed her head. Aluz said that everything was correct, and looking at the wrists of Ali's and Tesfia, which were bruised from the pinches, he realized that they had been practicing even when they returned to the dorm. He admitted that they surprised him, but said out loud that Alice and Tesfia should not be distracted. Tesfia asked him to remain silent, and suddenly magic appeared in her hands again. She leaned her back on the sofa and exclaimed dissatisfiedly that everything was working out very well. Aluz said that they saw everything themselves and thought that they still needed to practice more. Alice suggested that Tesfia try again, but Aluz apologized and said that they would end there. Tesfia looked at Aluz in surprise and asked if he really had anything to do. Aluz said that he had a little work to do, and soon he was walking down the corridor. He opened the door to Sisti's office and went inside. Sisti was waiting for him and, smiling, noted that Aluz was just in time. Aluz asked why Sisti called him here. 
She asked if Aluz knew that there would be an aptitude test early next month. Aluz remembered that this was in the curriculum and asked if this concerned his rank. Sisti said that she was concerned and added that she didn't want any fuss about it, so she would be the one to review his test. Aluz said that he understood everything, but seriously noted that she could not tell him everything, so he asked what the real reason why he was here. Sisti smiled and took out a document from a drawer in the desk, and Aluz was glad that this would end so quickly. Sisti handed Aluz the document, saying that this is it. Aluz carefully read what was written on the paper and realized that this was a proposal for the school to take a new curriculum outside the walls so that students would gain experience in fighting demons. In surprise, Aluz opened his eyes wide and asked what Sisti wants from him. Sisti said it looked like it, but really she just wanted his opinion. Aluz asked if he could ask Sisti something first. He noted that this was an offer from the military, and therefore assumed that it was all because he had resigned. Aluz asked if this was true. Sisti looked down sadly and assumed that was so. She admitted that this happened later than she expected, because, after all, all the other academies had already implemented this curriculum. Sisti wanted to say what the problem was, but Aluz interrupted her and noted that the students here did not undergo such training, so all it would do was more deaths. Sisti admitted that she also thought so, and Aluz realized that this was an order from the very top, and she could not ignore it. He said, since the wall was said to be weakening, it would be better to prepare the students for the real battle, and asked if that was true. Sisti thought about it, and assumed that the senior management was in a panic, since Aluz had left the front line. She said that she was always only on defense, so Aluz knows more about demons than she does, and Aluz asked what then does she want from him. Sisti said that he could do something about it, and asked if that was true. She awkwardly asked if he could go and influence his superiors. Aluz seriously said that this would not happen, and Sisti noted that then he could easily take care of them. Aluz asked, what is the point of the new curriculum then? He thought for a moment, and, looking at the documents again, realized that according to this proposal, the first years would be transferred to the upper years under supervision to go against the demons, but even taking into account the difference in training, since they are also new to slaying demons, they would not be much more effective freshmen. He noted that his biggest concern is that there is a risk that high school students will be completely useless. Aluz asked how far they are allowed to change the order of this sentence. Sisti explained that it could be done as long as it didn't interfere with extracurricular activities. Aluz pointed to a place on the map and asked if this was the area. Sisti confirmed this, and Aluz said that there are only low-rank demons in this area, although B-rank can still appear here. He pointed to another place and said that it would be better here, although it was far away. However, he still added that he could not say that it would be absolutely safe. Aluz said that the appearance of high-ranked demons can be detected within a radius of a couple of tens of kilometers from the wall, but nevertheless, some B-rank monsters can still slip under the surveillance grid. He thought they should focus on training monitors, and asked if Sisti could suggest having a real mage watch over the students instead of a high school student. Aluz admitted that he understood that this would not happen, and Sisti confirmed that it would be difficult to do. Aluz suggested that in that case, at least the highest-ranked students could be asked to provide supervision, or even some teachers. Sisti twirled the pen in her hands and suggested that she could do it, but admitted that it would not ease her headache. She told Aluz that it was established that one group would consist of five students, including an observer. She said thoughtfully that she also needed to figure out how to arrange this, and Aluz looked seriously at the frowning and concentrated Sisti. He thought that even the director would not take the risk of going against the might of the army, and it was normal that she would take it so seriously. Aluz did not imagine that if Sisti was going to tell him about all this, that he would have to make at least a little effort to help, and, turning around, said that he would leave Sisti at that, wishing her luck. Sisti exclaimed in surprise, and Aluz asked displeasedly, Is it really something else? Sisti exclaimed that she had completely forgotten to treat him to tea, and, grabbing Aluz by the hand, she dragged him deeper into the office, not listening to his objections. Some time later, Aluz asked how long Sisti planned to keep him here. He added that he would not help her, and Sisti asked why he said that. She asked him to make himself comfortable and offered to talk. On the day of the test of abilities, Alice and Tesfia, ringing the doorbell of Aluz's room, shouted that they had come for him. Alice noticed that Aluz hadn't slept much lately and asked Tesfia if he was okay. Tesfia said that she told Aluz off for this yesterday, so she doesn't think they need to worry. 
She was sure that Alouz was in excellent condition today, but at that moment the door opened and Alice and Tesfia saw a tired and dissatisfied Alouz. Tesfia asked if he really didn't get enough sleep after everything she said. Alouz did not answer, but only slammed the door in front of the girls. However, they forced him to open it again, and Alouz, tiredly leaning his back against the doorframe, looked at Alice and Tesfia. Tesfia mockingly said that he was pathetic and added that if he couldn't sleep, he could try sleeping next to her. Alouz objected dissatisfiedly, adding that he manages his time as he wants, so Tesfia does not have the right to say whatever she wants about it. He explained that it wasn't because he couldn't sleep, but added that it might give him a chance to have a good night's sleep, so they could try it. Tesfia was very embarrassed by these words and awkwardly said that she was just joking, and Alouz displeasedly noted that she was annoying him. Tesfia looked at him indignantly and thought that she couldn't believe that he was actually talking to her like that. Alouz looked at them indifferently for a while, then asked if today was really the day of the test. Tesfia shouted at him to quickly get ready and leave. Sometime later, already dressed in uniform, Alouz walked down the street, yawning and thinking that after that the director called him to her every evening and decided that it was necessary to refuse her more harshly because she was annoying to the point of horror. Tesfia at that moment called out to Alice and asked if she had already watched how the test would be done. Alice admitted that she didn't look, but just repeated a little, and Alouz, turning at them in surprise, asked what was there to repeat. He explained that this test was purely based on a person's practical ability, and Alice and Tesfia looked at Alouz in surprise. Alouz added that memorizing would not give anything here, and Tesfia asked herself with disappointment, why then did she study during all her free time? She indignantly asked, who cares? Tesfia exclaimed that practical skills still boiled down to this, and counting to two, sharply struck with her fists, and after that, on the count of three, she raised her leg as if throwing a blow, but she stumbled and fell. She closed her eyes in pain and suddenly noticed that her skirt had ridden up. Tesfia was very embarrassed by this and quickly jumped to her feet. She noticed Alouz looking at her seriously and asked if he really saw everything. Alouz said that he had to say no and decided that it would be better to go forward. Alice patted the embarrassed Tesfia on the back soothingly and they set off. Finally, all the students arrived in the training room and the teacher noted that everything was in place. He explained that the result of the morning test would depend on their mana output and explained that their rank when entering this school was not very accurate and therefore this test would help better judge their talents. The students began to worry and the teacher asked for silence, explaining that this would not significantly change their rank, so they should not make such a fuss. Alice and Tesfia sat, looking ahead in fear and excitement. The teacher added with a smile that as magicians, it is important for them to hide the magic they can use, so the test will be carried out behind a black veil. He asked the students not to be shy and to show their strength to the fullest. Deciding to start, the teacher opened his notebook and looked at the table drawn in it. He told Alouz to go to area number 9, and Alouz, with an indifferent expression on his face, stood up and went to the right place. He entered area number 9, where Sisti was already waiting for him, who, noticing Alouz, said that there he was. She asked why he didn't bring his weapon. Alouz said that he had no need for this and asked if he really needed to do this. Sisti confirmed this and asked Alouz to first go into the first measuring apparatus and release some mana. Alouz took off his sports jacket, remaining in a long-sleeved turtleneck, and did what he was asked to do. He walked up to the device and, closing his eyes, released the mana. Sisti said that was good and looked at the monitor where the calculation began. The calculation percentage reached 90, and Sisti was surprised to think that she was seeing such a number for the first time in her life. She assumed that the car had broken down, but Alouz said that was not the case. Sisti did not answer, continuing to look at the screen in surprise, and Alouz explained that he was always on the front line. He asked if they could move on to the next test. Sisti confirmed this and mentally asked if being on the front line would really give someone that much mana. She asked if Alouz was really born with that much mana. However, Sisti thought that this could not happen. She explained to Alouz that the next test was to use the magic he had learned. Sisti handed her the next measuring tool and asked her to put this one on. Alouz warned that the army had stopped measuring his ability with this test, and Sisti asked why. Alouz put a wide metal bracelet on his hand and explained that the sensor could not measure the mana output when he used magic. Sisti thought about it and asked, who cares? 
She asked Alouz to just do it and looked at him with eyes full of anticipation. Alouz said that it would definitely break this way, and although he was sure that they had more, he suggested stopping at just one. Sisti agreed with this, and, pointing to another cone-like device, asked Alouz to use its magic. Alouz stood in front of the device and said that he would do it, and after that he called on magic, thinking that it was better to hold it back just in case. At this time, the teacher called the name Alice and told her to go to zone number two. Tesfia wished her luck, and Alice smiled and wished her the same. She stood up and walked in the right direction, when suddenly she heard something and stopped in surprise. Everything around shook, and the students and teacher looked around in bewilderment. When it calmed down a little, the students began to fearfully ask what happened. They assumed that it was an earthquake or something exploded, and at that moment Sisti came out of area number 9, and the teacher approached her and asked how to understand this. Smoke poured into the corridor from area 9, and Sisti asked everyone to calm down with a smile. She said there was nothing special here, so she said to keep doing the tests. Alice and Tesfia watched this, and Sisti, with a wave of her hand, removed all the smoke, and Alice, suddenly turning to Tesfia, asked if this was not the zone where Aluz went. The two of them ran to the door and worriedly asked if Aluz was okay. They saw him standing among the smoke remaining inside, and Aluz, holding the propeller in his hands and looking at it, asked them not to worry, because he just did something that was a little in vain. Sisti asked Alice and Tesfia to leave the area, as they were still in the middle of the test. Alice and Tesfia obeyed, and Sisti, looking at Aluz, said that, no matter what, she was surprised that Aluz was capable of such a thing. She noticed a broken measuring device and said that Aluz was a walking anomaly. Sisti suddenly remembered his magic and suggested that it was the magic of space manipulation. She thought that this was to be expected from someone who had once been a solitary magician, and Aluz confirmed this. Sisti thought about it and noted that, in addition, there was also a strong release of heat, and asked if this had thus caused the fusion phenomenon. Aluz thought that this was incorrect. All the heat and blast wave was caused solely by the fact that he put in too much mana and the equipment itself exploded, while fusion was a subtype of the fire attribute and a very high level at that. He remembered that magic was divided into different attributes, and some people had an affinity for a certain kind, and that affinity would have a big impact on how a person would use it. Aluz thought, if he had to say, then in his case he does not feel a similarity with any attribute, so it would be unpleasant if he found out about it. So if this misled Sisti, it is very convenient for him. Sisti continued to reason, and said that a mage of Aluz level, using his specialty, would achieve much greater results, so she doubts that it is Aluz affinity. Aluz interrupted her reasoning, and Sisti said that she should not try to interrogate him further. Aluz asked what about the test. Sisti explained that his test results did not result in an error, but in an inability to score it, so he would receive the highest score that could be received for it. Aluz asked, is this really so? Sisti explained that this was the end of his morning test and asked if there were any questions. Aluz said that this was not the case, and Sisti, looking at Aluz, who was almost out of the room, wished him good luck. When Aluz left, Sisti put her hands on the table and lowered her head to it, thinking that it was rather careless of her, because she allowed her inner magician nature to get a little agitated. At that moment, a girl came inside and, apologizing, attracted Sisti's attention. Sisti sat up straight and apologized for showing such a side of herself. She looked at the girl and said with a smile that now it was her turn for the test. She asked if the girl was confident in her abilities. The girl confirmed this and added that she had gone so far precisely for this reason. Some time later, Aluz was sitting in the office, his head on the table, and thought that he had forgotten his lunch. He suddenly heard some sound and, raising his head, saw someone put a package on the table next to him and asked if he really hadn't taken anything with him. Standing next to Aluz were smiling Alice and Tesfia, and Aluz noted with displeasure that it was them again. Tesfia confirmed this. Alice and Tesfia put a bag of food in front of Aluz, and he asked if they were sharing. They said that there was nothing special about it, because they just bought food from a kiosk, and Aluz, taking out the food from the bag, turned to Tesfia and admitted that he hoped that she would behave more modestly. Tesfia irritably told him not to eat then, but quickly calmed down. The three of them started eating, and Tesfia suddenly called out to Aluz and asked what happened then. Aluz chewed a piece of sandwich and asked in what sense what happened. Tesfia reminded them about the morning test, and Aluz explained that the measuring instruments were out of order. Tesfia asked if this was true. 
Aluz asked displeasedly whether she really wanted to meddle in other people's affairs. Tesfia looked at Aluz in surprise and admitted that he was right, because it was some kind of unnecessary pushing. Aluz thought he couldn't blame them for being curious, but he didn't have to teach them anything other than basic magic. He said out loud that if Tesfia could fight him, he might find out the answer, and Tesfia confidently said that she would soon catch up with Aluz. Alice added that she would also try, and Aluz suddenly remembered something and said that as a thank you, he would tell them about today's test. Alice and Tesfia looked at him in surprise, and Aluz said that the test would simply be a simulated battle. He explained that such battles are used to test a person against strong enemies, and added that he believed that the majority should go against a strong opponent. Tesfia asked in surprise where did Aluz get this information. Alice asked who is the source of information for Aluz. Aluz thought that he knew this from the director, but he could not say it. He said that it was just a good way to evaluate rank, and rising from his chair, added that this did not mean that defeat would necessarily lower their rank. Aluz explained that it was important to pit students against an opponent they could not beat in order to properly evaluate their abilities. He added that if they win, then we can say that they have not reached the limit of their capabilities. Tesfia said that no matter who she goes up against, she will fight with the intention of winning. Aluz looked back at the serious Tesfia and wished her luck. Tesfia thought that Aluz was mocking her, and Alice asked if he was really leaving already. Aluz confirmed this and explained that he needed to take the test before the main group. Alice and Tesfia said that they would see each other later then and wished Aluz luck. After Aluz left, Tesfia asked Alice who she thought Aluz's opponent would be. Alice thought for a moment and assumed that it would be the director, and Tesfia asked if she was serious. Aluz came to the training room at that moment, and Sisti, noticing his appearance, noted that he had finally arrived. Aluz looked at the girl who was standing next to Sisti and asked if she was the one who had been watching him earlier in the training room. The girl bowed and said that she was pleased to meet Aluz. She explained that the governor general had assigned her to become his partner and said that her overall rank was 1,034 and her search rank was 53. She also said that her name was Loki Livel. Aluz looked at Loki and asked himself, was this a ploy by the army? He thought that if a person ranked among the top 100 magicians in detecting demons, he could become the observer's partner, but that was not the case. Aluz said that he does not need a partner, and he does not think that she, a high-ranking magician, has the desire to waste her time on him. Sisti said that Loki may not have any experience as a partner yet, but she believes that she will be an exceptional partner. Aluz asked displeasedly, doesn't Sisti agree that by partner she means observer? Sisti said that for their mock battle, they would fight each other, so she asked Aluz not to jump to conclusions just yet. Aluz said that he understood everything and added that talking would not convince him of anything. Loki stepped aside to stand opposite Aluz at the right distance, and Aluz, looking at her, noted that she was in an army uniform, but looked very young, just like him in the past. Aluz suggested just getting it over with, and Loki said thank you very much to Aluz. Aluz thought that he had a feeling that he had already met Loki once, and Loki, looking seriously at Aluz, asked if he would allow her to become his partner if she could land at least one blow. Aluz thought and asked himself, does she still want to arrange an official duel against him, knowing his rank? He grinned and, thinking it was interesting, said if she could do it. Sisti asked why don't they start at this point. Loki concentrated and ran to attack Aluz, grabbing small daggers for throwing from special mounts. Aluz mentally asked if she was really coming straight at him. He noted that Loki was overestimating himself and caught the daggers thrown in his direction. Loki, noticing this, thought that as soon as the magic was activated, she would strike it with one blow. Loki jumped up, preparing to attack but Aluz suddenly raised his hand, in which he was clutching the daggers, and Loki asked in surprise whether the magic had not been activated. She jumped back, and Aluz apologized for this and said that he had rewritten the magic. He threw the daggers towards Loki, and she dodged it and ran towards Aluz again. Aluz noted that she was well-trained and thought that her mana level was in the triple digits. And suddenly one of the daggers remaining in the air approached Loki, and at some point a bright light appeared around it. Loki thought with horror that Aluz had surpassed her magic. At the last moment, she jumped away from the dagger and suddenly froze in fear, feeling Aluz behind her, who said that this was the end. Loki turned around, drawing another dagger, and Aluz noted that this was a good reaction, as expected from a locator of her rank. However, Aluz easily intercepted Loki's hand when she tried to attack, 
but she still tried to throw the dagger. This flew by, and Aluz asked why not Loki go to the front line. He noted that her skills were more than enough, and added that if she was in the army, she should know that he did not take partners. Loki thought she knew that Aluz had turned down countless requests, and on top of all that, he had received the title of Lone Mage. However, Loki had no intention of staying and, taking out several more daggers, she frowned, preparing for battle. Aluz thought that everything was clear to him, and realized that in this case he would have to show Loki how huge the gap in their abilities was. A huge skeletal figure appeared behind Aluz, and Loki looked at it in fear, realizing that this was the true power of the strongest. She fell to her knees and, aligning the daggers, thought that even one blow was not possible for her so she asked if she could do it. She stopped her thoughts and decided that she had to do this. But suddenly she realized with horror that her body was not moving. At this time, Sisti asked in fear, What is this? She looked at the arena control monitor and saw that there was a system error. She thought that the damage shifting system could not cope with Aluz's mana and shouted that the system had stopped working, so it was dangerous to continue the fight. She suggested putting it off. Loki, still unable to move, tried to persuade herself to move, and thought that even if she stood up, the result would not change because she would never reach a lose. She decided that in this case she would do something differently, and getting up with difficulty, she ordered herself to move. She realized that she could not be near a lose, and the lose looked in surprise at Loki, who was seriously frowning. Daggers suddenly rose up around Loki, and she, saying that with roaring thunder it would appear on the heights of Fulgur, called upon magic. Sisti looked at this in surprise and exclaimed that she couldn't believe it because it was rank 8 thunder magic. She noted that at Loki's age, even magic of one direction is difficult, and Loki at that moment activated the explosive lightning spell. An attack of powerful force was sent towards Aluz, and he made a magical shield, protecting himself from it. He waved his hand, dispelling the spell and the dust raised from it, and saw Loki, moving his legs with difficulty, walking towards him, wearily asking if she showed herself well. She buried her head in Aluz's chest, and he admitted that it was beyond his expectations. Loki said with relief that she was glad about this, and thinking that Aluz did not remember her, she dropped the gem from her hands. Aluz looked at this in surprise, and Loki fell to the floor, losing consciousness. Aluz knelt down next to Loki, picked up the stone, and, calling Sisti, exclaimed that Loki urgently needed help. Sisti, running up to them, asked what happened. Aluz explained that it was an exchange of power, and Sisti asked if Loki did this. Aluz added that if nothing was done, Loki would die and thought he was surprised that she used the Divine Core. He looked at the cracked stone lying in his palm and remembered that the Divine Core was the foundation of a demon, and to lay the foundation of humanity's defensive line when demons appeared, it was usually used to buy time. Aluz noted that this serves well to temporarily replenish the lack of mana, but in return it takes away a person's life force. He squeezed the stone in his hands, and it completely crumbled, and Aluz thought that it was a vile tool, and mentally asked why Loki did this. He noted that if she died, she would achieve nothing, and looking at Loki, he realized that she was getting worse every second. Aluz realized that it was too late, and Loki only had a few minutes. He reached out his hand to Loki's neck, and thought that she knew that this could happen if she used the stone, and as a sign of respect for her determination that she would not continue to suffer, he would do it quickly. Aluz used magic, and a translucent blade appeared on the tip of his finger, but Sisti stopped Aluz's hand, shouting for him to stop. She sat down on her knees next to Loki and Aluz and asked, What about healing magic? Aluz explained that this was useless because Loki's injuries were not physical in nature, and healing magic, in fact, was only used to heal interesting wounds. Sisti desperately said that something could be done and asked if he could replenish Loki's mana. Aluz mentally repeated this sentence and thought that it was common knowledge that mana differs from person to person, and the exchange of this is impossible, however, on the other hand, a simple replenishment is possible. He noted that the idea itself is bad, and it seems there is no other choice. Sisti excitedly tried to suggest something else, but Aluz stopped her with a movement of his hand, and, turning away, thought that since it was about him, no common sense would stop him from turning everything upside down. Rising to his feet, he noted that since Loki was still conscious, the price was paid immediately. He said out loud that there was a way, and Sisti began to answer him, but Aluz interrupted her words, saying that he had one condition. 
he looked at Sisti and said that she would promise to take everything she saw to the grave with her. Looking seriously at Sisti, Aluz asked what her answer was. Loki thought she had a headache and her whole body was numb. Suddenly she heard someone asking, what would Sisti answer to this? She realized that she had heard Alu's voice and suddenly asked where she was. She saw trees and a cross with raindrops rolling down it. Loki thought it was a very familiar smell and began to remember. She, still very little, was sitting on her knees in front of a grave cross, and suddenly a man approached her holding an umbrella. He, shielding Loki from the rain, said that he was very sorry for her parents because they were both heroic magicians. He added that he also regretted that he could not return their bodies, and noting that she was only eight years old, admitted that he did not think it would be fair to ask her about this, but still asked why she should not do it. To the military academy as a trainee magician, the man leaned closer to Loki and placed his hand on her shoulder, noting that she didn't have to make a decision right away. He suggested that Loki hated demons, and said that there were many children like her, and if she wanted, she could become a powerful magician, just like her parents. Loki, looking at the wet cross, called mom and dad and, crying, promised that she would become stronger and find them. The peaceful days she had taken for granted were suddenly taken away from her. Loki and the other trainees, holding weapons in their hands, cut objects thrown in their direction by special equipment. The instructor watching them shouted displeasedly that their movements were getting slower. He told them to think that their time of rest would come only when they died. The trainees unanimously agreed with this, and Loki, trying to fight off another projectile, suddenly stumbled and fell, closing her eyes in pain. She sat with her head down, trying to hold back her tears, and at that moment a man walked up to her and shouted for her to get up. When Loki stood up, he stepped aside and, clenching his hands into fists, said that this year there were only useless interns. A little later, Loki was lying on the bed, her knees pulled up to her face and her hands covering her ears. She thought she had a headache and her whole body was numb, and at that moment there was a loud signal from the speaker on the wall. The interns began to run out of the rooms, and one of the girls entered Loki's room, shouting that it was already collection time. Loki sat up in bed with difficulty and left the room, lining up with the others on the street. She felt hatred. Standing among the other trainees, she heard some of them talking about how the other day one of the trainees suffered a serious injury and lost his leg as a result. Another intern noted that this is already the tenth case this year, and tomorrow will be his day. Loki did not turn to look at them, thinking about her hatred. Some time later, during training, going through a special track, Loki thought that she had to survive, because mom and dad were no longer around, and no one would protect her. Loki ran along the tall, thin pillars, and, taking aim, threw several daggers, attacking the targets on the wall. She realized that no one would help her, and she was on her own, but suddenly she stopped and, not paying attention to the huge hammer that was swinging from side to side, acting as an obstacle, asked herself, why was she trying so hard? She asked what she lives for. One of the girls, noticing that Loki was not dodging the hammer, shouted her name, and at that time the hammer hit Loki, knocking her off the pillar. Loki fell down and, hitting the ground with her back, before losing consciousness, she saw the girl calling for the instructor. She thought that she missed her mom and dad and wouldn't do it herself, and noted that the hatred just kept growing and growing, and it felt like it was suffocating her. Loki remembered how she sat with her parents outside in the shade of a tree, and they stroked her, smiling happily, on the head. Loki thought that if she could, she would like to repay them for everything. Some time later, a drop fell on Loki's forehead, and she woke up, sitting up in bed. At that moment, a girl entered her room and exclaimed with joy that she had woken up. She admitted that she was worried because Loki had slept all day. Loki looked at the girl in confusion, and she explained that Loki had fallen and lost consciousness during training, and the others said that she had a slight concussion and a few scratches. She noted that she was glad that Loki at least fell on the net, and Loki, rubbing her eye with her fist, said that she now remembered. The girl said with a smile that she had brought what was left from breakfast, and advised Loki to eat well and rest, and she would soon feel better. The girl put a tray of food on the bed next to Loki, but Loki didn't even look at it and said that she was fine and didn't care anymore. The girl looked at her sadly, and then asked Loki to listen and, taking out a jewelry from under her jacket, said that this necklace belonged to her mother, and this was the only thing that could be returned. She suggested that if not for this, she would have lost her last hope, and admitted that she was confident that Loki would find something that would be hope for her, 
so she asked her not to sound so depressed. Loki looked at the girl, and at that moment a signal was heard, and the girl, realizing that it was time for training, said that it was time for her to go, and running out of the room, asked Loki to rest and shouted that they would see each other again. Loki sat on the bed, thinking about hope. She asked how many days had passed since then. Loki was sure that her parents were still abandoned in the outside world and not even buried, and she clenched the blanket in her fist. Very little time passed, and the instructor looked in surprise at Loki, who also came to training, and asked if she should not rest today. Loki confirmed this, but still walked up to the other trainees lined up in rows, and the girl, noticing her, said that she told her to rest. Loki reiterated that she was fine and strongly considered burying her parents so they could rest in peace, as it was the least she could do for them. And after that the hard training continued. As the days passed, the number of dropouts increased, and Loki trained harder than ever to one day achieve her desired goal. She fought and ran, and suddenly the instructor called out to her. Loki drew attention to him, and the man said that two years had passed since her appearance here, and a lot was being said about her achievements. Loki thanked him, and the instructor admitted that he was sure that other trainees could not compare with Loki, and asked why not then test her skills on someone stronger. He pointed his hand at the man who approached them, who turned out to be a very young Alus. Alus looked at Loki indifferently, and she mentally noted that he had beautiful black hair. Soon Alus and Loki stood opposite each other in a special arena, and the instructor announced that they could begin. Loki put her weapon forward and threw it at Alus, but he, keeping a calm expression on his face, deflected and Loki was very surprised by this. She decided that she would do something differently then, and ran towards Alus, intending to attack him, but he again dodged her attack and, tripping Loki, looked indifferently as she fell to the ground. Loki thought with horror that she could not follow Alu's movements. Looking back on this, Loki noted that this was her first defeat in a long time, and it was as if she was confronting an adult. However, despite the fact that Alu's only appeared in trial fights, she gradually began to look forward to fights with a man whose name she did not even know at the time. After another battle with Alus, Loki lay on the bed and, looking at the ceiling, thought that today she held on longer, so she was definitely getting better. She wondered if she could become just like Alus. Loki decided that next time she would ask his name, but after that day Alus did not appear again. Loki remembered looking around as she stood among the other trainees and thinking that Alus was gone today too, wondering if he had dropped out of training. She knew that this could happen, but she thought with regret that she had never been able to find out the name Alus. Another two and a half years passed, and they received the first order to destroy the demons. The man standing in front of the lined-up boys announced that the first line of defense had been breached by the invading demons, and the Alpha Nation had suffered severe damage. He explained that a fierce defensive battle had defeated it, but they must finish off the escaped demons. The man said that ten of the trainees would be formed into a squad and advised them to obey the orders of the squad leader. He knew that some of them had only recently received their magician's licenses, but he added that they were now short-staffed and could not be careless. Loki looked resolutely at the man, and he wished them good luck and asked them to take care of them. The guys replied that they would do so, and some time later a friend of hers approached Loki, who exclaimed with joy that they were in the same squad. Loki confirmed this and, stepping aside, listened to the conversations of the other guys. Someone was happy that they would finally be able to show what they were capable of, but they answered that they had heard that they were being sent to deal with the weaker ones who remained. The intern said that he didn't care, exclaiming that he would kill all the demons. Loki walked over to the map, hanging on a special board, and looked at it. She noted that their destination was not far from the place where her parents died. Loki checked again and again, so there could be no mistake. She thought that she would finally go out into the outside world, but the reality turned out to be a real nightmare that no one told her about. Loki sat hiding behind a stone, and, widening her eyes in horror, asked herself why this happened. The demon at this time bent over the bodies of the other trainees, tearing it apart. One of them, still alive, hardly asked for help, and Loki, covering her ears with her hands, thought that she had to help, otherwise everyone would die. She desperately said that she was very sorry and thought that they had trained for so long for this day, but in the end it turned out like this. At this time, the demon ate the body of one of the trainees, and Loki suddenly felt a slight gust of wind from a sudden sharp movement. She opened her eyes wide in horror and saw that part of the stone she was hiding behind had been broken off by the demon's blow. 
She looked out a little from behind the cover and saw that the head of her comrade, who was still alive, had been cut off by this blow. Loki hid behind the stone again, covering her mouth with her hand, and the demon approached. Loki thought with fear that she would be eaten without achieving anything. She looked at the jaws of the monster that were right in front of her and, apologizing to her mom and dad, closed her eyes and prepared for death. Suddenly, she heard someone displeasedly note that they didn't make it on time. Loki opened her eyes and saw a man in a long cloak land on the demon's head, killing it with one blow. It was Alus who looked at the dirty and surprised Loki. When the dust from Alus's blow cleared a little, he jumped off the demon and, going up to Loki sitting on the ground, asked if she was okay. He noted that she should not put pressure on herself and, patting Loki on the head, apologized for arriving so late. Loki lowered her head sadly, and Alus, sitting down on one knee next to her, suggested that she could not move now. He asked her to climb on his back and promised that he would take her to the meeting place. Loki did as she was told and soon Alus was running through the forest with Loki on his back. Loki thought that this was the same guy, although he was taller and his voice was deeper compared to the last meeting. She realized that Alus had not given up training and suddenly noticed that they were running past destroyed buildings. Loki screamed and asked Alus to stop here. Alus did this, and Loki, running up to the ruins, sadly said that without a doubt the fourth outpost was here. Alus asked in surprise, what's here? Loki said that her parents died in this place, but immediately corrected her words and added that she heard that they died here. Looking around, she thought that she was ready for this, but there were no traces of remains. Loki noted that a lot of time had passed, and picking up a stone shaped like a tombstone from the floor, she placed it on the ground and apologized to her parents for doing this so late. She pressed her palms together as if about to pray and closed her eyes and Aluz, coming closer, did the same. Loki, noticing this, looked at Aluz with a smile and thanked him. Aluz told her not to worry about it and Loki thought that she had finally done it. However, she also noted that she does not know what to do with her life now, but decided that thanks to Aluz she was able to express her condolences, and therefore, what is left of her life that he saved, she will use for him. Loki asked if she could find out his name. Aluz said that his name was Aluz Regin, and Loki suddenly opened her eyes. She sat up in bed and asked herself why she was seeing this dream again. She thought that she would never forget about the promise she made that day, and at that moment Aluz, sitting in a chair next to the bed, noted that Loki had finally woken up. Loki looked at him in surprise, and Aluz explained that she had lost consciousness, so he brought her to the infirmary. Loki lowered her head and sadly thought that she had made a mistake and realized that she was too scared to look at Aluz. Aluz awkwardly rubbed his hand on his neck and apologized for being late to help that day. Loki opened her eyes wide in surprise, realizing that Aluz remembered everything and exclaimed that he had done nothing wrong. She again remembered meeting Aluz as a child and thought that during training and even on her first mission, he saved her. Tears flowed down Loki's cheeks and she, burying her face in the blanket, thought that she had decided to give Aluz her life. Sisti, sitting in her office, put a piece of paper on the table and said that it didn't look good either. She hoped that everything would be fine with them and thought that thanks to her, they would be able to conduct mock battles more effectively. Sisti noted that they had little time, so they needed to make a plan as soon as possible. She sadly lowered her gaze and said that she was sorry, but perhaps this was the only option. Having calmed down a little, Loki turned to Aluz and, remembering her attack, admitted that she had done something she shouldn't have done and crossed a line that no magician should ever cross. She sadly said that she would accept any punishment and closed her eyes, and Aluz said that it was good. He came closer to Loki, and she closed her eyes, pressing her face into the blanket, but Aluz simply lightly touched her head with his palm. Loki raised her head in surprise, and Aluz said that he would forgive her for this, but admitted that he could not ignore the fact that she risked her life for something like that. Loki threw the blanket aside and stood up from her bed, starting to say that she had done something unforgivable, but Aluz suddenly turned to her and covered Loki's mouth with his hand. He looked warily to the side, and Loki called out to him. Aluz suddenly opened the door sharply, and Alice and Tesfia burst into the room. They didn't expect the door to open, so they fell to the floor, and Aluz said that he couldn't believe what they were eavesdropping on. Tesfia and Alice stood up and Tesfia looked at Loki and awkwardly said that they simply had not seen her before. Alice asked if she was really a first-year. 
Alus suggested that he needed to introduce her and, pointing his hand at Loki, announced that she was his new partner, whose name was Loki. Loki was surprised by this, and Alice and Tesfia also opened their eyes in surprise and asked again, Is it really a partner? Loki took hold of Alu's clothes, attracting attention to herself, and wanted to say something, but he said that she won that fight because she managed to hit him. He leaned closer to Loki and in a whisper asked her not to worry about what happened, because only the director and he were there at the time, so it would be easy to hide. Loki embarrassedly tucked a strand of hair behind her ear and wanted to say something, and Alus asked displeasedly if she really wanted him to lead her by the hand to the army. Loki closed her eyes, and then, smiling, thanked Alus. Alus said that he still needed to go somewhere, and added that Loki could rest in his room for now. Loki said that she understood everything, and when Alus left, she turned to Tesfia and Alice and asked permission to introduce herself. She said her name was Loki Livol, and Tesfia and Alice also gave their names. Alice noted that she was pleased to meet Loki, and the three of the girls went to Aluz's room. Alice said she wanted to go back to what they were talking about. She asked if Aluz even needed to go to the academy. Alice explained that Aluz was still going to school, but was still part of the army, so if they called him up, he had to follow orders. Tesfia exclaimed in surprise and noted that Aluz was having a very hard time. She suggested that this was logical given his abilities, and noted that he was still going through some pretty rough times. Tesfia added with a smile that she found it difficult to imagine Aluz obediently following orders. Loki, who walked behind Alice and Tesfia and listened to their conversation, indignantly asked herself, what kind of impudence is this on their part? She turned to Tesfia and Alice and revealed that Aluz was in the army, standing on top of it. Loki suggested that they did not know how much Aluz contributed to humanity. Alice and Tesfia turned around and looked at Loki in surprise, asking again. Loki repeated what she said about how it seemed like Tesfia and Alice didn't understand that Alpha Country was enjoying these happy times mainly because of Aluz's sole existence. She added seriously that if they understood that, they would never call him Al in such a carefree way. Tesfia and Alice looked at Loki in silence for a while. And finally, Tesfia admitted that it was true that they did not understand, but added that they knew that in order to achieve the best, one must go through unimaginable efforts and suffering. Alice sadly said that it seemed that Aluz was so far away that it was difficult to make him their target, and admitted that perhaps it just didn't fit in their heads, because he was on a completely different level. Tesfia added that, on top of that, she thinks that something is wrong with Aluz. She said that she was thinking about paying her respects to him as the best magician, but putting that aside, Alus was their precious friend first and foremost. Tesfia said that, besides, Alus looks like a guy who can get enemies without even knowing it. Alice exclaimed that this might be a little rude, but she understands what Tesfia is talking about. She remembered with a smile that Tesfia also first challenged Alus to a duel, and Tesfia exclaimed indignantly that it was inevitable, because she did not know then. Alice laughed, and Tesfia said that when she first saw Luz, she couldn't help it, and it made her curious. She explained that Luz didn't let people get close to him, and that was why he seemed a little lonely and isolated. Loki thought sadly that Luz seemed lonely, and Tesfia and Alice said that that's why they thought that while Luz was at the academy, they should at least treat him as a friend. They noted that there was something else. Loki looked at them in surprise, and Tesfia came closer to her and asked if it was right that she did not know this side of Alus. Loki sadly admitted that this was true, and thought, even if she explains the greatness of Alus, Tesfia and Alice will not be able to understand a little, because they are young as magicians and still do not know the outside world. The three of them continued to walk down the corridor, and Loki asked if they were really receiving instructions from Alus. Alice confirmed this, but added that they had just started doing this. Loki thought that Tesfia and Alice were a little jealous, since they saw a side of Aluz that she still doesn't know about. At this time, Aluz was sitting near the window and drinking tea. He put the cup on the table and said that he wanted to talk about the case with Loki. Aluz expressed the hope that Sisti would not tell anything about this, and she confirmed this with a wink. She added that this also applied to what happened on the training ground, and Aluz looked at Sisti with displeasure. She wondered how he deceived Loki and asked about it. Aluz admitted that he had not done anything special and thought that even the director, who was watching what was happening from the side, did not know exactly what happened because she only saw the end result. 
He remembered what happened and noted that it was an emergency method, and what he did was take all the mana present in Loki's body and replaced it with his own mana. Aluz believed that it contains two types of mana, the first of which is familiar to everyone, namely the energy of the body, and the second is the only one of its kind, desired and thirsted for by everyone. He noted that he had adopted predation, which easily absorbs any mana and is an atypical and terrifyingly powerful type of mana. First of all, the reason why mana cannot be supplemented is because of the rejection reaction that occurs, however, by using the nature of his mana, Aluz can completely absorb Loki's mana, preventing it from mixing. Moreover, he was able to infuse normal mana into her body and complete the mana replenishment process. He thought that, nevertheless, the risk of death was not zero, but everything worked out, and over time, his mana remaining in Loki's body would slowly dissipate. At this time, Sisti looked at the papers she was holding in her hands and said with a smile that it was good that he decided to protect Loki properly. She put the documents on the table and pushed it towards Alus. Alus took it in his hands and, starting to read, asked what it was. Sisti explained that these were Loki's acceptance papers and noted that her signature was already there. She added that Loki's abilities are not very good, but she is clearly more capable than many others. Sisti admitted that it was difficult to believe that Loki was a four-digit mage, and Aluz, continuing to study the documents, said that, based on Loki's combat abilities, she was close to two-digit mages. Sisti smiled and explained that Loki's highest rank was 157, but nevertheless, she still decided to take on the role of assistant. She noted that it is obvious that Loki has good compatibility with detection magic, however, even when she was in the army, she never got close until today, hence her rank was reduced to four digits. Sisti added that she would ask her about the rest later, and Aluz, having finished reading, put the paper on the table and, getting up from the sofa, said, even if Sisti asked Loki, all he needed to do today was make sure that she didn't will open his mouth about what happened to Loki. He admitted that he was pleased to know that he didn't have to do anything, but Sisti tucked her hair behind her ear and smirked, saying that she had not yet received payment for her silence. Aluz, who had already begun to leave, turned around and looked at Sisti in surprise. He turned to her and asked if she seriously wanted some kind of favor from him. Sisti stood up and said that Loki only did this because of him, and therefore if she covered for her, she would be taking a big risk. Aluz said, if possible, he would prefer to deal with this with money. Sisti moved to the sofa, near which Aluz was standing, and said that, unfortunately for him, she did not need the money. She put her hand on Aluz's hand, which was lying on the sofa, and asked if he knew. She asked Aluz to lend her his power and help her with her upcoming battle training. Aluz looked at her doomedly, and Sisti, closing her eyes, smiled awkwardly. Aluz thought that combat training would begin in a month, and realized that Sisti had not come up with a plan. Sisti admitted that she was very sorry, but there was no other way than to make it work to minimize student casualties. Aluz put his elbow on Sisti's head and said, even if someone like him is around, there is no guarantee that he will be able to protect all the students. He asked Sisti not to say that she asked him to save students every time when their lives were in danger or something like that. Sisti explained that, to some extent, they want the students to have at least some combat experience, otherwise the training will be of little benefit. Aluz turned around and said displeasedly that he could not help much, because constantly moving half-heartedly back and forth was a little too much for him. Sisti exclaimed that she would come up with clearer instructions and again asked Aluz to help. She reached out and placed it in his hair, saying she was counting on him. Sisti removed her hand and looked hopefully at Aluz, and he, putting his hair in order, replied that Sisti is always very calculating. He thought that she always bothered him very much, but he doubted that there was any other way to do it. He said out loud that he understood everything, and in that case, he would go. Sisti raised her hand to bid him farewell, and, with a wink, said that they would see each other later. Aluz left the office, closing the door behind him, and thought that he had taken the necessary steps to bribe Sisti, however. It seemed that this was not necessary. He began to walk away from Sisti's office, realizing that since he got here, he began to do things that he would never have done when he joined the army. Aluz was content as long as he could relax, and that hasn't changed, and oddly enough, he doesn't find the situation unpleasant. Aluz smiled and remembered that before that he had always refused to enter into agreements with other people. He guessed that they had already started training around this time. Soon Aluz entered the room and saw that Loki was sitting on the floor, 
and Alice, sitting next to her, was braiding her hair. Tesfia sat smiling on the couch and watched them, and Aluz asked what happened to their training. He noted that this was not a place for fun, and Alice, Tesfia, and Loki looked at Aluz. Loki stood up and exclaimed that she was very sorry. Aluz said that this was not something serious, and thought that he would need to talk to Loki about how she addressed him. Alice and Sisti said everything was fine and explained that they were simply deepening their friendship. Alice hugged Loki and asked Aluz to look at her. She exclaimed that Loki was very cute, and Aluz said that he wanted to inform them that Loki's maximum rank was 157. Alice and Tesfia were very surprised, and Aluz continued and said that Loki went through many real fights and her real abilities are closer to a double-digit magician. Tesfia said that this could not be, and Alice asked in surprise if it was true. Loki said that compared to Aluz, she is no match for him. Mentally, Loki was glad that Aluz recognized her, and Aluz at that moment told Alice and Tesfia that Loki was a year younger than them, but she was accepted into their class, which means that the two of them are the best in their class after Loki. He suggested that it would be better to spend more time supporting her, and Tesfia tilted her head down and closed her eyes. Alice looked at her in bewilderment, and Tesfia admitted that they were just resting a little. Alice confirmed this and said that they were just having a discussion about mana, but suggested that they would leave that for another time. Aluz thought with satisfaction that they were finally motivated to train, and, looking at Ali's and Tesfia, asked how the mock combat exam went. They were silent for a while, and then Tesfia asked if he wanted to know. Aluz thought that, judging by Tesfia's tone, she had failed the exam miserably, and said out loud that he had predicted it anyway, so she didn't have to say anything. He was pleased to hear that Tesfia had gone through an unpleasant experience, and Alice suggested starting training. They turned to each other and began to train, and Aluz walked further into the room, and Loki followed him. She turned around to see what Alice and Tesfia were doing, and saw them pinching each other's arms. She asked Aluz if this was mana manipulation. Aluz at that moment approached his table and sat down at it, and Loki, standing next to him, suggested that because of her, Alice and Tesfia began to be complacent about the peace of the world. Aluz said that this does not apply only to them, and Loki exclaimed that this is not so. She explained that it was their own fault that they didn't realize the danger, and added that the death rate for mages in Alpha Country was so low thanks to Aluz's efforts, and the girls simply didn't understand what that entailed. Aluz thought that it was simply inevitable, however, if he disappeared, the Alpha Kingdom would no longer know what to do, and this probably made the higher-ups nervous, which is why they suggested combat training. She looked at Aluz and understood why he distanced himself from the army to focus on his investigations. Aluz marked the location on the map and admitted that he didn't really care what happened to the upper management, however, in order to live in peace, they would need more practical high-level magicians. Loki wondered if they would be of any use, and Aluz said that no one knew. He noted that they were obviously superior to regular academy students, and Taxes asked why he was teaching them the basics then. Aluz said that the director forced him, but added that, in addition, there are advantages to this. Loki asked what are these advantages. Aluz explained if they became at least double-digit mages, then they would feel a little relief and asked if that was the case. Loki asked if he really thought they might have a hidden talent. Aluz, returning to studying the map, repeated that no one knows this. He thought that there are many boundaries that cannot be overcome by talent and hard work alone, whether they can overcome them or not, because it depends on their perseverance in life. Aluz circled the place on the map and, pointing his finger at it, said that at the end of the day, only those who managed to survive would be able to reach new heights, and that's when they would understand who is who. Aluz took the map in his hands to carefully examine it again, and Loki sadly bowed her head. Some time later, Loki and Aluz stood in Sisti's office. Sisti, who was sitting at the table, sighed tiredly and suggested that they could end their meeting here, since it was already quite late. She summed it up by saying that on the eve of the test, Aluz would reduce the number of monsters while Loki remained at the base to hunt it down and give orders to the others. Sisti admitted that it would be much easier if they could act openly, and added that she should remain here in case of an emergency, but from time to time she would check on the progress of the exam. Loki turned to Aluz and asked if he was sure that she did not need to participate in the fight. Aluz said if she concentrated on giving orders, everything would go very well, and Sisti said with a smile that some people were just too greedy. Loki objected that he still wanted to give the students at least some combat experience, 
and Alouz said that thanks to Sisti, they would be able to cope with this situation without any problems, and said that in this case he would leave the distribution of teachers among teams to her. Sisti said, since the exam results were already known, she planned to distribute the high-ranking invigilators into groups, starting with the first-year students with the worst results. She thought that tomorrow they would announce extracurricular activities for all students, and Alouz turned around and said that he was counting on Sisti, and without turning around, waving his hand, announced that he would go. However, he suddenly stopped and, turning to Sisti, added that he would not want people to reveal him, so he asked that a simple combat uniform be prepared for him. Sisti said with a smile that she would do as he said, and Loki and Alouz left the office. Alouz, who was walking a little ahead, told Loki that this time she was tasked with tracking down monsters, but added that if she wanted to continue to be his partner, then she needed to improve her skills. He noted that her recognition radius is now one kilometer, and admitted that in a given situation he uses the same radius, so if Loki wants to become a good partner, then she needs to increase this distance to five kilometers. Loki was very surprised to hear this figure, and Aluz continued, saying that she should also improve her combat skills, but asked her to concentrate on the intelligence area for now. Loki replied that she understood everything and promised that she would not let Aluz down. Soon they came to Aluz's room, and he, seeing Alice and Tesfia, asked if they had really been standing here all this time. Tesfia congratulated him on his return, and noted that they were just about to return. Alice turned to Loki and asked if she wanted to go with them. Loki said that they shouldn't worry about this, because since she is now Aluz's partner, they will sleep and eat together. Alice and Tesfia were horrified when they heard this, and imagined that Loki would feed Aluz herself and sleep with him in the same bed. Aluz wearily put his hand to his head and told Loki that this was a common thing in the army, but civilians were not used to this. Loki said that she understood everything, and Alice then suggested going to the dorm after all. Loki thought about it, but eventually said that she still refused. Tesfi exclaimed indignantly that this could not be done, and she would not allow it, and Alice asked if Loki really doesn't feel awkward when he is left alone with a guy. Loki calmly explained that this happened often in the army, and added that, apart from what Aluz did, she would not feel any awkwardness. She noted that Alice and Tesfia did not understand anything about this, and Alice wanted to say something indignantly and Loki asked why not join in in this case. She repeated that this happens often in the army, and Tesfia, looking at Aluz, asked, Is it really happening to him? She exclaimed indignantly that she would never do this, and Aluz led Alice and Tesfia to the door, telling them to go home. They said that they had not finished talking yet, and Aluz said that Loki would still need to go to the director's office. Tesfia turned to Aluz and said that he was a pervert. Aluz looked in bewilderment after Alice and Tesfia were leaving, and Loki, approaching him, called out to Aluz in concern. Aluz asked her not to think about it, and added that there was something more important. He asked to stop calling him master, but Loki objected that it would be disrespectful. At that moment, a signal suddenly rang out from a special device attached to the wall, and Aluz guessed that it was a private line. He assumed it was the governor and asked Loki to leave for a moment. Loki agreed with this, and leaving, said that she would take care of dinner. Aluz inserted a special earphone into his ear and asked if something had happened. He didn't think the governor general would have contacted him to hear the usual report, and the governor said, if only it were that simple. Aluz asked with concentration whether it was inside or outside. The governor replied that it was outside, and apologizing, noted that Aluz had been making friends at the academy for a long time. Aluz asked if he was really going to feel sorry for him. The governor general wearily admitted that he was not going to do this, but added that this was a very useful experience for Aluz. Aluz admitted that for now all he was doing was working, and the general asked if he was having fun. The general governor said that he had sent Aluz the plan, and Aluz, looking at the device, said that he accepted it and explained that he had plans for the morning, so he would do it now. The governor general thanked him, and Aluz thought that he did not want to work in the academy uniform, so he needed to change his clothes. He put on different clothes and was about to leave the room when he suddenly heard someone ask if he was really going somewhere. Aluz turned around and saw Loki looking at him with concern. Aluz said that he was going for a walk, and Loki ran to the other side of the room, shouting that she would change clothes, but Aluz grabbed her by the clothes and told her to stop. He said that for now they are partners only in words, so they will have to wait a little before this is approved by documents. 
He added that, besides, Loki was still sick, so she would not help him in any way. Loki said that she understood everything and asked when he would return. She was suddenly horrified and thought that no one knows what could happen abroad, so making plans at such a moment is very stupid. Aluz silently looked at Loki for a while, and then, stroking her head, promised that he would be back before breakfast. Loki bowed slightly and said that was good, and Aluz left. He sat down on the windowsill and, looking around, seriously thought that the sky inside the walls was nothing more than a projection, but he had even gotten used to this fake. Aluz noted that this could not be seen behind the walls and suddenly looked at the moon and asked, Is it really a full moon today? Tesfia at that moment was sitting on the bed in her room and sadly thought that she had gone too far, calling Aluz a pervert. She realized that she was stupid for being rude to Aluz in a fit of emotion, and realized that an aristocrat should not say such things. Tesfia assumed that he was angry with her and, closing her eyes, pressed her lips tightly together. She suddenly asked why she was upset here. Tesfia told herself to be more cheerful and decided that she would immediately go and apologize to Aluz. Soon she was walking down the street, heading to the boys' dormitory, and looked around, watching the burning lanterns and the bushes rustling with leaves. Closing her eyes, she thought that she had only now realized that she should have rested properly and apologized tomorrow, but she remembered that Loki was also there, and also something else. She sadly asked why Aluz didn't refuse. Tesfia continued walking and suddenly stopped when she noticed a man on the roof. The man's cloak fluttered in the wind, and Tesfia looked at him in surprise. She asked if it was Aluz. Aluz suddenly turned around and, squinting, looked at Tesfia, and she was a little scared by this. Tesfia saw Aluz jump from the roof and disappear, and, falling to her knees, asked herself in bewilderment, what was that? Eventually she returned to her room and Alice congratulated her on her return. Tesfia was very sad and did not answer, and Alice assumed that something had happened. She asked Tesfia if she wanted to go into the soul. Alice added that it was already late, so if you go, then only now. Tesfia said that she would do it, and undressing, went to the shower. Standing under the water, she washed herself, and, remembering how Aluz looked at her, she thought that this was the first time she had seen such an Aluz. Tesfia asked if this is what the strongest magician looks like. She remembered that she wanted to get into the top hundred magicians of their country, but she knows nothing about the real world. Leaning her forehead against the wall of a small shower stall, Tesfia realized that all she knew was a carefree life within the walls, and only Aluz saw the real and cruel world. She clenched her hands into fists and said that compared to his work, her efforts were worth nothing. Tesfia noted that she tried so hard and asked if it was not enough. She sadly assumed that she was a worthless sorceress who wasn't even standing on the starting line. Some time later, Aluz straightened the sleeves of his clothes and thought that he still had time before tomorrow. Suddenly, the doorbell rang and Aluz, looking at the screen of a special device, saw that it was Alice and Tesfia. He asked why they came early in the morning. After turning on the microphone on the device, Aluz said that the door was unlocked, so Tesfia and Alice could enter. He went to the door, and when Tesfia and Alice entered, seeing a strange expression on their faces, he asked what was it. Tesfia sadly lowered her head, and then suddenly closed her eyes and asked Aluz to forgive her. She exclaimed that yesterday she told him all sorts of things without thinking, and Aluz asked again in surprise. He couldn't remember anything like that but he decided to play along with Tesfia and asked her not to worry about it and come in. Tesfia thought and noted that Aluz was behaving as usual, and suddenly Loki appeared right in front of them, who realized that it was them who had come. Alice and Tesfia looked at Loki and were surprised at her clothes. Loki stood in front of them, dressed in her school uniform, and Alice noted that this outfit suited her very well. She exclaimed that the school uniform looked really good on Loki, and Tesfia agreed. Alice suddenly added that she was sorry that she did not go with them yesterday, but Loki said that she had already said everything. Aluz suggested that they quickly go to class, and during this the teacher asked permission to introduce them to a new student. The students, looking at her, noted that she was very cute and looked just like a doll. Loki announced that she would now study with them and said her name. Loki, smiling, looked towards Aluz sitting in the distance, and the two guys sitting in front of him exclaimed that she looked here. The second student noted that Loki had an incredible smile, and Aluz, holding his head with his hand, thought that Loki wanted to say that everything went well. The teacher asked Loki to sit in any seat she liked, and Loki did so. 
After this, the teacher pointed to a special board and, saying that they had dealt with the new student, suggested moving on to announcing the exam results. He explained that the names of the best students were presented on the screen and added that they could come closer and see for themselves. The teacher also added that, in addition, their licenses had to be renewed according to their rank. Alice and Tesfia took out their licenses and looked at the rank. Alice's rank was 17,833, and Tesfia's rank was 14,500. The students who went down to the screen to look at the list saw this and exclaimed in surprise that Alice and Tesfia had a high rank. One of the girls noted with a smile that this was not surprising because they worked very hard, and Tesfia, turning to Seal, said that she, too, could get a four-digit rank if she tried. Seal sighed and said that it would not be in this life because she would not achieve this even if she studied with them. And suddenly someone asked if Loki really had rank 570. The students crowded around the screen were shocked because Loki had even overtaken Farinella. Loki, who sat next to Aluz, checked her rank through the license, and Aluz thoughtfully asked himself if she had been tested in battle with him. Loki asked in surprise why she received such a high rating. Aluz said it was thanks to that great magic. He added that considering her strength, he was not at all surprised that her rank was close to 500th. Aluz admitted that it was strange that Loki had a rank of 1034, and suddenly one of the students, noticing that Aluz and Loki were talking and sitting next to each other, asked if they really knew each other. Loki confirmed this and explained that Aluz had helped her out more than once, and Aluz was glad that he could force Loki to call him Al. He thought that otherwise people would have a lot of questions. Some time later, Loki, Tesfia, Alice, and Aluz were sitting in the dining room having lunch. Alice, who was sitting next to Loki, exclaimed that she was very glad that she could dine with her. Tesfia, looking at Loki and Alice, turned to Alice and reminded her that the break would end soon, so she should eat faster. Aluz asked why are they here. Two guys sitting at a table nearby looked displeasedly at Aluz and the others, and one of them noted that Aluz was surrounded only by beautiful girls. The second admitted that he was very jealous, and Aluz, having heard this conversation, thought that soon their carefree school life as students of this academy would become nothing more than a fleeting dream. And suddenly the bell rang, and a screen appeared on the wall in the dining room, on which Sisti was visible. She addressed the students and asked for permission to notify them of upcoming extracurricular activities. Tesfia, hearing this, asked again, and Alice asked in surprise, what does this mean? Sisti said that each of the students at this academy would go through this for two weeks, and Aluz thought that it was time to tell the others about what the real world was like, and Sisti continued and added that everyone would take part in the operation to destroy monsters. Sisti repeated that they would be taking part in an operation to destroy monsters for the next two weeks, and all the students were very surprised by these words. Out of surprise, someone dropped the tray of food from their hands, and it fell on the floor. The students asked in surprise if she was really talking about destroying monsters. Someone asked displeasedly what kind of sudden announcements were these. Students asked each other if they heard it. Sisti announced that they would learn the details during class and repeated this. Alice fearfully said that they had never participated in a battle before and Tesfia asked her not to worry and said uncertainly that they would probably cope. Aluz watched this silently and suddenly someone called out to him. It was Farinella who said that it was very good that she had met them. Aluz confirmed this, and Farinella noted that they were having lunch together. She looked at Loki and noted that this was their first meeting, and Loki remembered that Farinella's name was on the board with high-ranking students. Farinella smiled and said that she was pleased to meet Loki, and Loki noted that the feeling was mutual. Farinella asked worriedly what awaits them. She suggested that other schools had done similar tests before, but this was new to the students at this academy. Aluz looked at Farinella and thought, if he was not mistaken, then Farinella would be the observer of the freshman squad. He said that no one expected this, and Farinella assumed that it would be very difficult. Aluz noted that she was absolutely right. Some time later, Aluz, Loki, Alice, and Tesfia were sitting on the sofas in Aluz's room, and Alice said that after lunch everyone had been talking about these extracurricular activities. Tesfia said that many people invited her to join their group, but said that they did not even know if they could form teams themselves. Alice suggested that they would be told about everything on the eve of these classes, and Tesfia said that it would be much wiser to spend as much time as possible training and not rush around like the others. 
Alouz thought that this was well said, and reflecting, noted that it seemed to him that the girls were already accustomed to mana control training. He remembered that they could already talk without problems during training, and now they controlled mana without pinching each other. Alouz thought that they were definitely training in their room, and said out loud that there would be groups of five people, where a leader would be chosen. Alice and Tesfia looked at Alouz in surprise, and Loki shouted his name with displeasure. Alouz noted that she didn't even try to interrupt him, and Tesfia asked Alouz how he knew about this. Alouz opened the book he had previously picked up and said that it was obvious that he had heard about this from the director. He asked Tesfia to think, and Alice asked who Alouz would team up with. He said no one knows, but added that he won't put in the effort no matter what team he ends up on. Alouz thought that in reality his non-participation had already been confirmed. Tesfia asked if taking part in this test wouldn't risk Alouz being exposed. Alouz asked if, in Tesfia's opinion, he was really that careless. He rubbed his hand over his chin and said that they would see for themselves, suggesting that he would take the role of an independent observer and watch as they learned about this cruel world. Alouz grinned evilly and Alice asked him to stop. Loki seriously replied that she was sure that this would not be difficult for Alouz, and Tesfia admitted that she thought that even Alouz could not just stand by while a person was torn apart by a monster. Alouz just looked at her, and Tesfia nervously asked if he really couldn't. When Alouz didn't answer, she asked him to wait and asked, confused, if he meant that they would have to rely only on themselves. Tesfia wanted to say something cheerfully, but Alouz looked at her seriously, and she fell silent, looking ahead in surprise. Alouz said that he never needed anyone's trust, and Tesfia said that's not what she meant. She asked what about them. Alouz was silent, and Tesfia looked at him with sadness and hope. Alouz thought about trusting relationships and thoughtfully said that this also concerns them. Tesfia became angry when she heard this, but soon became sad again, and Alouz, looking at her, saw Tesfia lower her head and say that everything was clear to her. Alouz closed the book and realized that he had gone too far, so he needed to be more careful with his words. He opened a box that stood on a shelf nearby and threw some object to Tesfia and Alice. He said seriously that they would talk about it when they killed at least one monster, and said that they needed to prepare for a real fight with monsters because they would not know about their skills until they came face to face with the enemy. Alice and Tesfia looked in wonder at the items Alouz handed them, and Alice exclaimed that it was a training staff. Tesfia asked if Alouz was sure. He said that this was the first step towards trust and asked Tesfia to try, but she thought that was not what she was talking about. Alice and Tesfia gripped their training staves in their hands and tried to complete the task Alouz had given them, but in the end, nothing worked. Alouz asked himself, was he in a hurry? Some time later, the students were standing near the list posted on the wall, and Alice exclaimed that their names were there. She asked in surprise if they were really in different groups. Tesfia suggested that groups are determined by rank. Alice and Tesfia heard the students talking, asking each other if they would go to practice. Some of them noted that the training field was already occupied and asked what they should do. Alice seriously noted that the operation would begin very soon, and Tesfia, confirming this, said that she should train more. Every day Alouz and Tesfia spent time training, doing this not only in Alouz's room, but also at home before bed. Some time later, sitting in the cafeteria during lunch, Alouz announced that tomorrow they would go to extracurricular activities. He suggested cancelling today's training, and Tesfia said she agreed with it. She said that she planned to meet the guys from her squad after school, and Alice said that she was very happy for them. She noted that Tesfia ranks 4,500th in the ranking, so they will probably be equal to her in strength. Tesfia suggested that this might be the case, but admitted that she did not particularly care, because what was more important was that she was constantly quarreling with their observer. Tesfia was very worried about this, and Alouz thought that Tesfia was a rather stubborn girl, so it was not surprising that she quarreled with someone. He said out loud that this was a great chance to test how much all his efforts were worth, and Tesfia closed her eyes indignantly. That evening Alouz was sitting in his room and Loki asked what his plans were for the evening. Alouz put his hand on his neck and said that he needed to go to the director's office and discuss the plan for tomorrow's action. He remembered that during the entire preparation, he visited her office at least once a day, but they were able to minimize outside interference. Alouz thought that, after all, the successful completion of this test depended on the students themselves, and besides, most of the reinforcement units did not even have combat experience. 
Alouz admitted that he could not even imagine that he would have to use this, and getting out of bed, took out a small suitcase. He opened the lid of it, and Loki asked what is it. Alouz explained that this is his hour, which is called Sunset Fog. Loki looked at this in surprise, and noted that she did not see the magic formula. She thought that in theory this should be engraved on all hours, at which point Alouz said that his hour had a magical formula. He pulled the chain of the weapon, and Loki, looking at it in surprise, asked if she could touch it. Alouz said she could do it, but added that he didn't think it was anything unusual. Loki took the chain in her hands and, looking at it carefully, said that everything was here and the entire magical formula was engraved on the chains. Alouz explained that they were special chains with a unique order of formulas and added that, of course, he mostly remembered all the spells he used since it was quite simple to use. He thought that the magical formulas written on the hour helped magicians cast spells. Alouz noted that inexperienced magicians use formulas to cast powerful spells, but mostly it just speeds up the process of using it. The hour can also be applied to a basic systematic magic formula, the advantage of which is to reduce the casting time of the spell, as well as reduce the mana consumption. There is also an engraving called a single magic formula, and an hour with a similar formula allows you to cast only one spell, but in return eliminates the need to read it yourself and also increases the power of it to the maximum. Alouz noted that using the spell is a complex procedure that depends on several techniques and thought that Testia's hour only contained basic ice spells. He remembered that her ice sword is mainly responsible for the distribution of mana, but in addition it also regulates convergence, spell size, cast coordinates, power level, and also has the function of spell formation. Alouz thought that Hour's high effectiveness in battle was the result of Tesfia's hard training. Loki sat on her knees and, holding the chain of the Aluch weapon in her hands, was still looking at it and thought that concentrating magic on a certain link in the midst of a battle was akin to threading the eye of a needle while moving. She asked if the magic formula was engraved on each link of the chain. Alouz confirmed this and explained that he preferred to use single formulas instead of system ones, adding that this was due to the fact that system formulas would not bring him any practical benefit. Loki thoughtfully noted that this made his hour weak, but suddenly realized what she had said and, jumping to her feet, asked Alouz for forgiveness, exclaiming that she did not mean to offend him. Alouz asked her not to worry about this, and Loki said that he was right, because a powerful wizard like him would be able to use any spells without any problems. Alouz said that Loki should also start preparing for the operation, because you never know what could happen. Loki said that he did not need to worry, because she was always ready for battle, and took out a small blade from a special pocket in her clothes, showing it to Alouz. Some time later, Alouz and Loki walked along the corridor, and Alouz thought that there were still many students left in the school. They suddenly heard someone calling out to them, and Alice ran up to them. Loki admitted that it was unusual to see her alone, and asked if she was getting ready. Alice confirmed this with a smile, and said that Tesfia also decided to prepare properly. She suddenly asked, where are they going? Alouz replied that they were going to the director, and Alice suggested that they would have a very difficult time tomorrow. She asked them not to overdo it, and Alouz said that the director had already taken care of this, but promised that he would take note of it. Alice suddenly became very sad and asked if everything would be okay with them. Alouz continued on his way, but passing by Alice said that if anything happened, he would come to the rescue. Alice looked after Alouz and thanked him for this. Alouz, looking sadly out the window, suggested that this might be their last meeting. Alouz and Loki continued their journey and heard indignant screams coming from the director's office. Someone said that they could also be useful, but the director replied that everything had already been decided, so she could not make changes. Loki and Alouz looked at each other in surprise, and Alouz knocked on the door. Sisti gave permission to enter, and Alouz opened the door. One of the students asked displeasedly, what did they forget here? Sisti asked if they could wait a little longer. Alouz sat down on the sofa in the office and thought that Sisti had problems with the students. The guy turned to Sisti again and asked her to allow them to join the reinforcements. He and the other students explained that she was concerned about the casualties among the students and exclaimed that with their help it would be possible to do without casualties. Sisti wearily held her head and said that she had already said that she could not do anything. The guy exclaimed that many second year and third year students agreed with his opinion because this was too difficult a test for barely admitted freshmen. 
He turned to Loki and said that she was also a first year, so he asked her to say something. Aluz asked himself in surprise, do they really not yet know about Loki's rank? Loki said that for many first year students this operation would seem overwhelming, but admitted that she was sure that the director had taken into account many points and had already taken the necessary measures. She added that, nevertheless, she realized that their point of view also had its place, and seriously asked if they could therefore tell her about their merits. One of the students looked at Loki in bewilderment and chuckled nervously. The guys stammered that they had a fairly high rank, and Loki said that they might not continue. She asked permission to ask, and asked if they really thought they could be useful without proper combat experience. She frowned and thought that she couldn't let them waste a lose time, and said that was ridiculous. Closing her eyes and turning away from the students, Loki declared that the conversation was over. The students looked at her angry, and one of the guys promised that they would regret it. He wanted to say something else, but Sisti said that this was her decision as the director, and they would never change it. She smiled ominously, and the students, looking at her in fear, left. Sisti put her head on the table and asked for forgiveness. Aluz came closer and asked who it was. Sisti explained that these were second and third years, and Aluz asked in bewilderment why they even wanted to join the reinforcement squads. Sisti said this is to climb the ranking ladder, and added that such operations help improve ratings, and school ratings can greatly help in the future when serving in the army. Loki guessed that they thought they were strong enough to emulate heroes, and Sisti said that was likely true. She said that lately only such people have been coming to them, and Aluz, holding his hair with his hand, sighed and admitted that he was now beginning to understand what was wrong with the first-year students. He thought that all those from noble families, illustrious houses, and ancient families were chasing rank, and expressed the hope that this would not lead to problems. Aluz said that he wanted to talk about reducing the number of monsters. He said that most of this is activated at night, and is collected by the smell of the blood of relatives or human mana, so he will begin his task at dawn. Sisti thanked him for this, and Aluz asked what about his uniform. Sisti said that it was already ready, and, putting the suitcase on the table, opened the lid with a smile, showing the contents to Loki and Aluz. Loki looked at this with surprise and delight, and Aluz said with displeasure that Sisti had terrible taste. She asked, is this so? Sisti noted that Aluz was the only one who didn't like the uniform. At that moment, in the women's dormitory, Tesfia asked Alice if she was sleeping. Alice admitted that she was not sleeping, and asked Tesfia to try to kill the monsters one at a time, and if they came across a group of monsters, then disperse and carefully retreat. Alice said that this also concerned her, and added that if they kill the monster, they should immediately leave there. Alice reminded them to remember to check the monster cores, and Tesfia agreed with this. Alice smiled and said that everything would be fine, because Aluz said that if they were in danger, he would definitely help them. Tesfia covered her head with a blanket and exclaimed that this would never happen, and Alice laughed, thinking that Tesfia was very shy. She said that Tesfia was right, because they trained specifically for this moment. Alice thought that she would be lying if she said that she was not afraid, but she was sure that they could handle it, because they were trained by the strongest magician. Some time later, outside the walls, Aluz stood in his new uniform, holding the hour. His face was covered by a mask, and Aluz, looking around, said that it was very good outside. Suddenly someone asked if Aluz could hear. Aluz said that everything was perfectly audible, and his interlocutor said that in such clear whether there should be no problems with detecting the enemy, and also added that there were 23 monsters within a radius of one kilometer. The man talking to Aluz asked what he would do. Aluz thought about it, and said that it was worth reducing the number of monsters that the morning troops might encounter. Aluz heard in the earphone how they agreed with his order, and Loki, who had been talking to Aluz all this time, said that his combat uniform suited him very well. Aluz smiled and decided that it was time to start.